This is Andy Tube. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate a easier, quicker way to degrease and clean this Singer sewing machine. It happens to be a model 404. Uh, this is uh, on my to-do list because I've had several uh, subscribers and viewers asking for something like this where they want to clean the machine as best they can but they do not want to or they're not capable of removing all the parts that I usually do during a dismantling but they they have a dirty problem greasy uh, smells odors and they'd like to do something about that so that's the purpose of this video uh, as you go through the video if you uh, look down here along the timeline. I have it broken into sections now uh, with definitions of what that section is, like dismantling or washing or drying or things like that. So if you want to skip around or you want to go back and review a certain part of it, you can do that on the timeline. And uh, what I'm going to do at the start of this video has also been requested several times that I I show all the parts and supplies and tools and so forth that I'll be using during the video. So if people want to, they can gather that in preparation. But I do uh, suggest that you watch the entire video before you uh, do any work. And uh, you can often watch my videos at one and a half speed especially if English is your uh, primary language. So I'll get set up here and the first thing I'm going to cover is all the little tools that I use. So in no particular order, uh, here are the tools. Uh, yes, that's a leaf blower. <laughs> um, if you've watched some of my cleaning videos before, you're familiar with that. If you've never seen a sewing machine washed in the shower, <laughs> you're in for a treat. But once the machine is washed and degreased, it needs to be dried very well and as soon as possible to help avoid uh, flash rust. So I happen to use this uh, leaf blower and you uh, to, to do the bulk of the drying and in this case, I'll also be using a, a hair dryer so that I can get into a lot of the smaller areas and concentrated with air and heat because uh, when you don't take off the as many parts, the water has a tendency to hide in, in all of these parts and the connecting parts and parts that move together and so forth. And we especially want to be able to dry those. So that's the purpose for something to dry. Now people have told me they've used a heat gun too. And uh, that's fine. If you don't have a leaf blower, no worries. Uh, it's just going to take you a little bit longer. Okay, now for some of the smaller tools, I, you're going to need uh, to take off the covers of the machine if you want to clean inside, of course. And... Uh, you're going to need a couple of screwdrivers maybe for that and uh, I know some plastic machines maybe snap apart I don't know much about them but I've got a couple screwdrivers to to get done what I need to get done and uh, part of cleaning inside there I may have to scrape off some grease so I have some barbecue sticks and some little metal uh, pieces here if I have very stubborn grease especially in tight areas or um, hard to reach places and, and like the gears and stuff sometimes the grease in there can be very stubborn now I also use a lot of brushes on the pre-treatment um, pre-cleaning and, and treating with the cleaner on your workbench uh, is the way to go with this type of a cleaning. So I save old uh, toothbrushes and I do a lot of dry brushing um, if I can. I, I brush 
uh, the oily and greasy spots because if you can get it to stick to the brush and get out of there then the cleaning chemicals can do a quicker easier job and I do have a couple of wire detail brushes um, because some of the metal parts again can be very impacted with old you know 50 60 year old grease like the gears and dried varnished oil so I like to dry brush and stuff as much of the gunk around as I can to get it out and uh, I also will use other soft bristle brushes um, these are some uh, from a set of cleaning brushes I bought on Amazon I think it was 10 or 15 brushes different sizes for a few dollars and I have an old uh, long handle uh, this is actually a basting brush but I use it like a lint brush to try and help me clean the um, tension unit since we won't be taking it off and then for applying uh, the chemicals inside the machine um, I don't like to spray it as much as just dip this in some solution or full strength degreaser chemical and, and brush it on certain parts so I can control the application of it and I, I just bought a set of brushes at Walmart years ago uh, 10 or 15 brushes for about 10 bucks or 15 bucks and uh, this is the one I like to to put on the cleaning chemicals later I'm going to be putting on oil just on the bare shafts and rods because I've stripped everything uh, oil and grease out of the machine I want to brush them with sewing machine oil just to help prevent rust in the future and this brush I think was for watercolors it's very you know very soft and that's great for putting on oil and then some of the brushes were stiffer like for acrylic paint, uh, paints and uh, a, a shorter one like this and stiffer is great for putting oil or sorry it's great for putting grease on the gears and pinion gears and the hand wheel gear so that's what those brushes are for and this is a wheel brush I've got for a dollar and it's good for general scrubbing around inside areas of the machine and on the outside too once I take it into the shower and my wife picked me up this one for the same purpose it's it's got a little bit stiffer bristle than the wheel brush you know so I've used that a few times and that has helped so I'm thinking that that is most of the tools so now I'm going to move on to the chemicals that I use so many of you know the main thing that I use and have used for years is this original crud cutter cleaner and degreaser and stain remover I've tried a few of these type of things over the years and I've tried alcohol and kerosene and gun cleaning uh, solutions and stuff like that and this is what I've always go back to I buy it by the gallon at the local Home Depot and places like that you can also buy a smaller little bottle of it uh, that may be enough to do one machine like a little eight ounce concentrate I've seen and um, I've also seen many times a 32 ounce spray bottle um, of, uh, of already like diluted I think that's what I bought the first time and then I, I started buying this when I started buying this it was ten dollars a gallon I think this last one I paid about fourteen but uh, I'll use that full strength and half strength on some of the worst parts inside but then for cleaning in the shower I mix it about a 15 percent solution maybe 20 but usually about 15 in a spray bottle like this and uh, at whatever solution 
if left on the paint, this will dull the paint on a sewing machine. Uh, especially these older singers that have kind of a flat type paint, not textured. So uh, that's why I wait to clean the outside in the shower so I can spray it, scrub it real quick, and rinse it off right away. But those are the two main uh, cleaning chemicals. Now the parts I take off, I have cleaned in the shower with crud cutter, but a lot of times I'll take them to the kitchen sink and I'll clean them with crud cutter, some of the parts. And you can also clean it just with a dish detergent. You know, if you don't have uh, a degreaser type of, type of thing. I'm talking about the nose cover, the hand wheel, the, the arm cover, the bottom oil pan, stuff like that. I, I often clean in the sink, okay? And, um, Sometimes while I'm dismantling, uh, I have a potential of a very stubborn screw, and I have used a, a penetrating oil um, like WD-40. I know there's many others. I just use this one. And there is one screw in this uh, machine that can be stubborn that holds the motor bracket kind of thing. And so I've got that ready if in case I need that. Now once I get the, the machine out and dry it with those dryers I showed you, sometimes you'll get a little flash rust, just a little beginning of rust. Often if you put a little oil on it and rub it with a rag, the rust will come right off. But if not, I use this crud cutter, the must for rust which I have found to work fantastic, uh, especially on this fresh flash, flash rust, where I'll just take one of those little paint brushes and brush it on and boom, it's gone, and then dry it off or rinse it off with alcohol. So I have that on hand usually just in case. Okay? And uh, then... I get to the point where it is all clean and dry and beautiful and then I'm going to oil it and grease it. So the chemicals I use for that, I just use a standard uh, Singer oil, which I bought this for about three bucks. Th these are just all purpose machine oil is what they are. They don't have any other additives. And you can use uh, Dritz, uh, jo uh, Joy, I, no, not Joy, uh, uh, Lily, you know, just a, just a regular sewing machine oil. I put this on the big shafts and arms and so forth. And then when I get to the bushings and bearings and the parts, metal parts that rub together, I like to use this TriFlow Superior Lubricant with PTFE. That's kind of a Teflon additive. This helps prevent friction so uh, supposedly it prevents heat you know uh, less heat when the parts are moving together less friction so the parts will last longer a lot of you are probably familiar with this if you've uh, for your sewing machines and because of this machine has gears that need a grease I have some TriFlow clear synthetic grease I like this. It's it's chemical resistant. It's uh, waterproof. I like this because it seems to cling to the gears a little bit better. And uh, I buy this online. I've also found these TriFlow products at bicycle shops, bicycle repair shops and stuff around town. Or they might have the oil, and I'll ask them, hey, could you order the grease? And they do. And sometimes they have a better price than online. Maybe buy a couple of bucks. Okay. So we've got the machine is all degreased and washed and dried very, very well. And we've got fresh oil and grease all over it. Doing that oiling and greasing... Um, and sometimes after I wash and dry it and I go to oil it, I see little 
dirty spots here and there. So I do what I call after cleaning. And anyway, when I get that all done, I often have little oily and greasy fingerprints all over the machine. So I use a cleaner wax. Just one light coat of a cleaner wax. This is made by Meguiar. And you just buff it right on like you would any car wax. And it hazes up and you let it dry and then you wipe it off and it gets all that gunky little fingerprints and everything that I got back on the machine. Then I'll put on one or two coats of this Meguiar's Gold Class Carnuba uh, paste wax. You know, and, it, and it's, it is a paste, not a liquid like the cleaner wax. And you, you rub it on, let it dry, you know, and buff it off. And these Meguiar products were recommended to me by a friend who has classic cars that he cares for. And I'm, I'm very happy with them, but any... I'm sure any car wax would be better than not waxing it. So those are the, the primary chemicals that I use for the process. Now I'm just going to show you some other kind of supplies that I use. Okay. Okay, to protect my workbench area when I'm putting on chemicals and stuff, I usually just take some type of a plastic sheeting or this is a kitchen trash bag and I'll spread it out if I have newspaper I'll put that on top to absorb some of the moisture and then I'll do my pre-treating and pre-cleaning on top of that and uh, I usually have a couple of old sponges around I like these uh, softer kitchen kitchen ones with the little nylon softer nylon because I can even scrub the painted surfaces with these and they don't hurt it. So in case I need to do a little bit of that type of cleaning, I have those on hand. I always have a few rags around because I'm working with a cleaner and grease and oil, you know. So I'll have some of those handy. Uh, I have a little cup like this from a detergent, a laundry detergent bottle to put my um, crud cutter in if I want to use it full strength on the gears then dilute it 50% on the other nasty areas you know then I can just keep a little supply of it right there on the bench and dip my brush and apply it and then I usually have some kind of a container to put the screws in I'll be taking out a few screws and screws can tend to wander off <laughs> in my experience so I always have something something nearby uh, you know I know a lady that uses an old egg carton so she can keep keep the screws separated by you, you know the arm cover or the bottom cover or whatever so just just don't lay the screws around on a table or something put them in some container so that they don't wander off on you okay and that's just kind of the other supplies that I use. The last thing that I want to show you before we start is the washing area. <laughs> uh, to show you kind of how I set that up. Okay. Yes, so here we are in a bathroom of my condo. <laughs> and this is a this is a older from the 1980s you know molded fiberglass shower tub combination thing and I put down a old rubber mat so that if I'm turning the machine and it slips I don't uh, damage my fiberglass and I usually set the machine up on a uh, five gallon bucket like this because it's just easier on my back um, that's, you know, if you want to just put it on down on the surface where you're going to wash it and so forth, that's fine. Um, I just happen to use the bucket. And I've got a my shower handle ready to go. So you'll see in the procedure, I might uh, scrub the, the bottom real good and, and then rinse it off take a look at it okay that looks great and move around and the last thing I'll do is the painted surface so I can 
uh, use my little uh, hand spray gun and put some chemical on and brush it with those brushes and then rinse it right off. And then I'll empty the bucket, uh, you know, after the machine is totally rinsed off, empty the bucket and I'll bring in my blower and uh, blow dry it uh, as much as possible. Then take it back to my workbench and finish with the hairdryer. So my point with this is, once you start putting chemicals on the machine, wherever you are, you have to go through the whole process here. You, you put on your degreaser, your chemicals, you scrub it, whatever, you, you take it someplace and spray more stuff on, you, you wash it, rinse all the chemical off, dry the heck out of it to get it very dry, then take it back and you have to oil it and grease it. It's all like a big sequential process you know and again once it's washed and dried the quicker you can um, you know dry it good and get get lubrication back on it the better and uh, so you don't you know I can't tell you of the dozens and dozens of emails where uh, yeah I washed it and dried it, it was gorgeous and I put it on the table, and then a couple of days later, I went to oil it. Hey, the hand wheel doesn't do much, nothing, nothing moves. The hand wheel won't move, nothing moves. Well, inside those uh, bushings and bearings and stuff may have rusted up on you, and maybe you didn't get them completely dry. So it's better to, to have this area like this all set to go. So after you pre-treat it, you walk in here and finish cleaning it and rinse it and dry it. Whether you do it like this or you do it on a patio, you know, or you have a big wash tub or a utility sink, you know, whatever works for you. Just do the whole thing <laughs> um, in a sequence all together is, is your best bet. Okay. I'll get set back up now and we'll start dismantling a few parts of the machine. All right, I have my uh, work area all prepped and my washing and drying area all set and everything laid out. So what I want to do is open up the machine so I can uh, clean it, of course. And I've, I've just taken off the presser foot and the needle to avoid any problems with that. On this type of a, a machine, the, the, especially the Singer, there's two screws usually that hold on the arm cover. So I've already loosened those. I'll put them in my little tool part container and the lid just comes right off. And we can see a lot of the old dried stuff here that I'll be cleaning later. But I'll, like I said, I'll be cleaning those in the sink. Let's turn the body here because now that I have that off, I can take the nose cover off. And on this type of machine, it swings open. There's two little hinge pins here that, that hold the nose cover on. So we'll just lift it straight up a little bit and then pull it off. That will also be cleaned in the sink. Coming down here, I'm wanting to open up the uh, bobbin area. So I put the slide back. I'm going to uh, use the throat plate position bracket to the unlock position if it'll go. doesn't want to quite go, so I'm not going to force it. It's stuck, doesn't want to go. Let's get the bobbin area parts out of here. Get the bobbin. I'm going to lift up the positioning bracket and move it to the side so that I can pull out the actual bobbin case. I can't tell if that's mostly dirt or if there's some rust there. Now I'm going to go ahead and take off the slide plate just by lifting it up a little bit and pushing it up 
back over the needle plate like that pretty grungy and everything in there I sure would like to get that needle plate up Let's see if I can I don't want to uh, force it and break anything if I can gently twist my screwdriver under here and get the uh, springs in there to compress I may be able to get it up enough now don't force anything here you don't want to bend your needle plate of course or anything like that but usually it's just dried up crud in there that there we go so I've got that off Mm -hmm. Put the bracket straight up. Look at all this. Ooh, it's worse in here than I thought. I'm going to go ahead now and put the pressure bar down. And I want to turn my tension to zero. So that's going to be uh, the least amount of tension on the tension disc here. So hopefully I can clean those. Okay. Coming around on the front, I, I just have one screw. So for the people that didn't want to take all the parts off, I'm, I'm trying to make it. These are very straightforward. You know, here you have one screw that holds on the lamp cover. Okay. <laughs> you might have two. Mm -hmm. Now I can get all this area in here. I can be cleaning that. I'll move around to the hand wheel area and put it in bobber wind bobbin winding mode and loosen the stop screw here. I, again, this is a very easy, uh, straightforward. This chrome knob is actually called a screw so <laughs> we'll just take that off mm -hmm. I'm going to put it in my parts container and I'm going to slide this off with the clutch washer you can see back there while I want to take that off and then I gently the gear back in here meshes with the motor pinion gear so if it seems to hesitate just wiggle it a little as you pull it out yeah there's the text to light gear in the back of the hand wheel okay but you see now I've got this whole area opened up in here so I can I can clean that if I want Okay, I'm going to lay the machine on the back, and I'm going to take off this thumb nut and felt washer and remove the bed plate, or oil plate, or oil pan. So again, I'm just trying to expose the inside of the machine for cleaning like that hmm. okay I can show you later in the video how I clean this and degrease it if I want but now we're getting an idea of what we're up against in here and you might be able to see all of this brown dark brown staining that's all dried up oil and grease that I want to get out of here mm -hmm. but the machine did turn I mean everything turned I sewed on it you know it's just got this old varnished oil all over it but that's why we want to degrease it now I can't wash the motor in the machine anyway 
So I'm going to remove one more screw here and this holds the motor bracket this little bracket that pushes on the side of the motor to keep the motor in place I get that out and get that little motor bracket out see if I can prop my machine up here and get you a better look in here maybe so I have these two wires, whoops, the two motor wires that are on little push-on tubes right there. I'm just going to pull off. If they're stubborn, you can take like a needle nose plier and, and work in there and gently pull. Don't pull on the wire portion. Pull on that plug. In this case, they're both white. Sometimes you have a red and a black. If you want to make a note to yourself, like on this one, this short black wire is on the right. And the brown wire going up to the light was on the left. Now, sometimes you can just pull this motor out. This one's not bad. Sometimes they're really stuck in there. There's different ways you can get it out. You can blow hot air up in there to try and loosen it. Um, you know, you can spray WD-40 on the side. It's like in a little tunnel there. One thing that I found recently works pretty good, which it was by mistake I found this, but if you lift up this side of the machine a little bit and, and drop it, like that, a lot of times you'll hear the motor fall down and, and hit your work area. Let's see if that did it. There we go. So that was enough to break it free. And you see in here, oh well, there's still wet oil and grease in here. Depending on the grease people use that can melt into oil and run down in here and then when it dries it, it gets really sticky in there. And that's mostly what grease is. Oil with some kind of a thickener. So there's my motor out. Yay! See? So now I can proceed with doing the pre-wash. That's all I'm going to take off. I'm not doing everything like I usually would to show you the possibilities here. So I'm going to set up here to start pre-washing the machine. Okay, ready to start the pre-treating and pre-cleaning now. I have a small container with a hundred percent solution of the crud cutter and a little bit larger one with 50 percent and I'm usually start on this type of machine on the bottom because it has the most gunk <laughs> you know oil oil uh, is subject to gravity so it goes down a lot of this uh, dark staining really is oil, dried oil. And it almost looks like they oiled the gears. There's so much oil down around in here. But as I mentioned uh, before, I'm going to dry brush the gears because if there's loose or wet grease, what I call wet grease, meaning it's soft, I want to get as much of it out of these gears as I can before I put any liquid on there. And this is just a, you know, use toothbrush here. I'll rotate a little bit. Now some people like to leave the hand wheel on for this if their machine is hard to turn. I'm just turning it by the arm shaft because it's not hard to rotate. And uh, so I, I do this a smaller a horizontal gear here first. Just get as much of the stuff off as I can. And if you have white lithium grease on there, I'm sorry. Because <laughs> it's probably hard and dry. And you may have to use something metallic to chip and scrape it off. So we're going to hope that you have a soft grease or... No grease. <laughs> uh, this didn't have too much, but some. So I'm going to continue that now on this uh, 
bottom vertical gear here. Okay. Okay, I've gotten loose what I can get. I brushed these a little bit, but it's hard, so it's not going to brush off. But I brushed out the teeth of these gears good. Now, I, as I said, I also have a wire type detail brush. So if you have very stubborn stuff in there, uh, also do it before you put any of the cleaner on. Just to try and get as much of it out as you can. So, you know, turn on some music or a ball game or whatever you like in the background and just take your time to brush out as much of this as you can. Now you have another uh, set of 90 degree gears here from the, the hook, sh uh, you know, power shaft to the hook shaft goes up to the hook. And without taking this uh, gear off, it's harder to get in here, so it takes you a little bit longer but you can still go in there with your brushes again and clean off as much of that as we can and go ahead and rotate it and get some more off in there and you can also use your wire brush in here you can get it in here you see how this is getting deformed from use? <laughs> this, these are two for a dollar, these little brushes. So when they get really bent out of shape and stuff, I usually take some metal snips and I snip off about half of the wire. So I have a very short bristle stiff that I can get back into this kind of an area better. Okay. So think about that if you have very nasty uh, gears on your machine. And I realize you might have a pulley and a belt on yours. Uh, I've washed machines with belts on them. And the type that have the internal motor, uh, like say a 337, 347, 457, 413, 513 like that you can loosen the bracket on those if you look at my playlist page for those models a lot of them I show you how to remove the motor bracket and loosen it to change the the motor belt you can pull it off and you can just pull the machine out the the, the motor out the end of the machine and cover it with a plastic bag and tape it up or use a rubber band to keep moisture out and just let it hang off of the machine there when you're in the shower if you have that type. Now electrical plugs and switches and stuff like that I, I've not had a problem with getting them wet. The secret is that you're drying stuff right away and very very well. Now, if you have a more modern machine with electronics, I don't think you would want to do this shower method. Uh, maybe it'd be fine, but I don't know. I mean, I've washed computer motherboards before, washed dry and no problem, but I've never washed a sewing machine that had electronic type uh, circuit boards. Okay, you're getting the idea with that pre-brushing to get it out. Now I'm going to take my 100% solution and I'm going to start brushing it on all these places just with my little artist brush here. I'm going to start brushing it on all these places that, are ha that have this dried up brown oil. And I just want to get a coating on there and let it start uh, going to work. Okay. And you'll see sometimes you can see the bottom of that gear is already clean. Uh, it just depends on the type of gunk that's on there and how thick it is. 
sometimes after this is on and soaking for a while I've had to come back and brush because they'll just be layer after layer after layer of dried oil but if you put this cleaner on there and you can put it on the plastic uh, and, and cords and stuff like that um, even if it won't wash it right off it's going to start softening it at least so you can come back with one of your brushes and uh, brush it off whereas if I brush this now even with the metal brush it's barely going to touch it it would be like taking that little metal brush to a piece of varnished wood you know, you'd scratch up the varnish, but you, it would take you a lifetime to get it all off of there. So, I'm going to continue this. Uh, let me show you this other uh, gear over here first. And just kind of get it on there. Now, I want to remind you that this crud cutter can dull paint, especially at 100%. <laughs> so, if you're uh, doing this pre-cleaning and later you'll see if some of it drips on the bed or the arm you know where it's going to be visible you want to just wipe it off right away with one of your rags and see here I'm going to do the whoops no you can't see I'm going to do the back of the wire terminal here I'll do the plugs Later, I'm going to get, well, I'll show you that now. If you remember, uh, where's my, yeah, if you remember my other brushes here. Remember these? So, I'm going to do a little bit up in that tube where the motor goes and up on this general area in here. You know, I got my little brushes. I can dip in my cleaner and and use if you got tight areas that you want to get into when we're up top I'll show you how I do those lifter pins on the needle plate so I'm going to be doing that for a little bit down here on the bottom alright I've got everything brushed and it's mostly just running free all the grease and stuff is loose um, you'll see these spots uh, where oil runs down and accumulates and dries. Um, like right, right there. See how dark that area is there? And brushing and soaking didn't quite do it because there's layers over the years. So that's when I will take my little wire brush and, and just scrub it. But it's nice and soft now. See how that's coming right off there? get a rag here so that stuff now will come off okay see all right and then uh, before I finish on the bottom here I'm going to take my whoop after spilling it I'm going to take my 50% solution and dip my uh, wheel brush in there To just kind of do one last um, kind of scrubbing up in that motor tube and up on the rocker shafts and lifters and into the little areas here. Uh, if you're not sure how clean you're getting it, you know, you can uh, take a rag and wipe off some of what you've already cleaned and see see how it looks you know and don't forget this is aluminum bed so don't forget to get up on the bed itself also has oil and junk on it I'm trying to think these machines were in the late 50s to very early early 60s so they're about 60 years old now you know and this has probably <laughs> never been done anything like this if, if it was serviced regularly the service guys would wipe it off with a rag or maybe a kerosene rag and then uh, add new oil and grease 
<clears throat> so, okay, I'm, I'm happy with that pre-treatment of the bottom here. So now I'm going to turn the machine so I can look at the nose end and see how that looks. Oh, by the way, before I turn it, you, you can see how this stuff runs through. You can see how why I put plastic. You can see all the dirty, oily water coming out. All right, up here on the nose, I am going to just uh, loosen the pressure on the presser bar a little bit. Get some of that threading exposed here. Uh, I'll start with the presser foot down and I think I'll go ahead and turn it so the needle bar is down mostly and I've just slipped a grocery bag over the bed so when this stuff drips down I won't have to worry about it sitting on the paint there okay and then back to my uh, cleaner and depending you can use up to a hundred percent you know if you want to just use 50 or 25 whatever whatever you think will get it clean in the amount of time that you want to spend on it and uh, usually most of this just getting the cleaner on there and spreading it around with the application brush is going to be enough to get it clean. So by lowering the bars, I can get back in here to the counterweight and the take-up levers and the tension-releasing pin area. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go ahead and move this up so I can get in from the side over here. oil's been thrown around and the nice thing about this all dripping to the bottom of the nose is there's usually a big accumulation of oil that has run down over the years when people oil their needle bar and presser bar and take up lever system and needle bar link and so forth so your cleaner is going to kind of accumulate down there too but that's good because it will be soaking and loosening all that up there okay let's see if I can lift up this presser bar now and I've got the needle bar up and the presser bar up and we can kind of see this area in here at the bottom better now and I can get my stuff in here better mm -hmm. so I'll continue this for a little bit okay uh, one other thing that we want to do uh, I'm going to uh, lift the presser bar while the presser bar is up and the needle bar I'm going to be sure I get some cleaner to go down into the bushings here okay because inside those bushings is going to be the same, you know, the same problem. So I want to be sure I get some of the cleaner inside there and let it rinse and wash that stuff out. And then I'll uh, come down here on the end. Is this showing up at all? <laughs> And kind of hard to get the lighting and everything in here. Maybe I don't need it. I want to go uh, uh, extra around the end of the presser bar and the needle bar and clamp because it really runs down the oil, you know, over the over time. Gets down in here and uh, accumulates, dries up. Sometimes you have to soak it and heat the 
needle clamp to take it off if you if you want to take it off but we're not doing that so i'm going to lower the pressure bar down to expose a little bit more of the end of it and i see everything is running out of here now very very clean and everything's loosening up real well this would be another place that if needed I could get some of these bottle brushes back into these areas that are hard to get a toothbrush or a uh, wire detail brush in here you know to, to get back in and scrub those areas okay mm hmm okay so you see you see how much gunk has come out of here <laughs> and this is just the pre-treatment <laughs> but that's why that's why I put the plastic down on the bed because I don't want that sitting on the paint okay I'll just go ahead and soak up a little bit of it here so when I'm moving it around I'll probably spill some more stuff when I do the upper arm mm -hmm. as a matter of fact that's what we're going to do next is the arm the horizontal arm so I'll set that okay so up here now we have uh, another set of gears uh, a uh, uh, horizontal well this is the vertical vertical gear on the horizontal shaft and down below the shaft is a horizontal uh, gear on top of the vertical shaft okay so I, I would prepare this the same way I'm going to uh, dry brush it is what I call it to try and get gunk off of there so I'm going to go ahead and do the wire brush it's more difficult to get to the lower gear so don't let that frustrate you just just uh, you know brush down in there as best as you can usually on the gears I'm almost always use a hundred percent solution so I'm gonna kind of slather that on there and I want to get it for sure onto that lower gear because I couldn't brush it as much. So I'll put some on here, these parts. Now you might get to some point here where the machine freezes up because we're taking everything off of the gears, right? <laughs> and some of the bushings and stuff too. So don't be surprised if all of a sudden nothing turns. And we'll fix that when we oil and stuff, but don't let it scare you. But that is why after washing we need to dry it right away. And I've had machines that I've washed and dried and have been totally, totally frozen. <laughs> so I just start putting oil on, you know, and, and uh, letting it do its thing. And pretty soon I get a little bit of movement and then a little bit more and stuff like that. The first machine I ever did was a 600E, and, and uh, I washed it and dried it, and it was the next day before I oiled it. And I thought I had created a boat anchor. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and paint the rest of these parts up here with the grease and treat them with the grease up top here. Okay, and... and I got my plastic down here in case it drips out of the bottom of the arm. I think I just said treat them with grease. <laughs> I, I meant the degreaser. So, so I did just that. I just went through and brushed uh, the degreaser here, the crud cutter on uh, the shafts and the pockets and everything that I could find to, to try and get uh, the old dried up oil. Now I've also treated this top ledge. This top edge seems to have a habit as well as the bottom of the arm cover where that mates with this of getting uh, a few layers of this dried up 
um, oil on here. I'm not, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it can be very stubborn right there. So that's one of the reasons I, I take my sponge. This I'm going to dip in the 50% and I'll have to scrub that because sometimes just brushing it on and washing it off doesn't always um, clear, clear that part up. Okay, so I'll give that a little scrub to be sure that's going to rinse off. And then I want to dry the overflow of the crud cutter off of here because I don't want it dulling that paint. Let's take a look here while we're upright like this at the back end here, that hand wheel area. And uh, I got to spread out my plastic a little bit here, it's bunching up. This can be uh, pretty notorious for getting grungy and stuff in there. So I am going to pre-treat that inside there. I'm getting low on my 100% crud cutter, so I just dip this wheel brush into the 50%. And I'm just going to roll it around in here and scrub it around a little bit to, to make sure I can loosen up all the old uh, dried oil in there so it'll rinse out. And it, there's usually some stubborn right down here at the bottom. And I, and I see it's there again. So I'm going to take a little bit of the 100% and soak that in there. Get it on the hard spots and let that work in a little bit. Then I'll come back to that after it's softened up. So let's do a 180 degree turn here. And I'm going to take off my uh, grocery bag I have protecting the bed. And if I see any overflow, I'll just wipe it up. But I have this whole hook area now that's, that's pretty grungy. Let's see if my... Uh, yeah, it's getting stiffer and stiffer to turn, but it's still turning. So with just about the last of my... 100% crud cutter, I'm going to brush this all up with it and get that soaking in there. Turn this a little bit more, rotate that hook. A little bit stubborn. This is a good place for those uh, skinny bottle brushes to go into these tougher areas here. Now, I'm going to try and put my pins all the way up. So I want to dribble a little of this crud cutter in there around the pins so that it'll go down inside. Remember, I had to pry these up with the uh, screwdriver to, to, to get the uh, needle plate off. Let's see how they're working now. Yeah, they still yeah, they still don't quite want to come up on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got the feeling that might be the bracket down below. Now more than the pin because when I when I lift There we go. Now they're both up. I'll put a little bit more of that. Let it soak in there. Okay. Again, I'm going to wipe off that excess there. Okay, that's 100%. That'll be... I see that some of the ink from this bag <laughs> stained that. That'll probably come off, we'll hope. <laughs> we get this ink bag. That's why I usually use a plain trash bag without any ink. Let's go back to the hand wheel end here now and see if this stuff in here is softened up enough that this softer wheel brush can get it loose. Oh yeah. Okay, so just soaking that short time. Um, now that I'm going back, everything that was built up and stuck there 
is is brushing right off. Okay. So we're making real good progress here. And let's come back to the hook. Although that didn't get to soak as long, let's take some of these uh, brushes in here and just first we'll try the nylon toothbrush. Yeah, it's doing well. Yeah, I can't quite. Oh, there we go. Get one of these down in here. I can get those feed dogs to come up a little bit higher. Nope, they're all the way up. Let's see if I can find a little smaller circumference brush here. Okay. Yeah, what whatever was on this hook seemed like a dirt and dried oil combination kind of. But I think uh, I think it's yeah, it's all loose now, so it will it'll come off in the shower. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's going to be the pre-treatment here. So let's. Uh, let me get up off of my stool here and make a little room. And I'm going to move my machine to the side here so that you can... Uh... There we go. You can see what has come out here during the pre-treatment. Mm -hmm. See all that? That's why I put down the the plastic okay so this I will toss and uh, dry up what spilt on my bench but we are off to the shower now now we're going to wash this baby okay so I'll get set up to wash and be right back okay I got my wash station here I've got some brushes I brought this brush my wife got me. I like it because it's kind of longer and I can poke it into areas. <clears throat> so in my spray bottle now I have about a 15% solution and uh, I, go, I have my shower ready to go, my nozzle down here, because so, I don't want it sitting on the paint for a long time. So I'm going to flood this area good you see it's running down on the paint but I want to get this in there and just kind of brush that up I kind of count in my head and I don't want uh, much more than about a minute on the paint okay so here I'll take my shower now and rinse that out good and I might, you know, as I go around the machine, I, I might come back to that area again. You know, it just depends how it looks after I spray it and scrub it like that, right? Now, I'll set this up. And it's, it's slippery when it has this cleaner on there, so you don't want to drop it. I'll get this hook area good. And give it a scrubbing in here. I think you're getting the idea, right? Right away, I'm going to rinse that. I'm going to rinse off this area. Usually the paint I do last. Anything that's just strictly paint. I'll go ahead and wipe it off a little. Now, let's do this whole top area now. I tend to put the hand wheel uh, lower so that it will kind of 
drain out the upright. Mm -hmm. This would be a chance for me to really get in there and the inside on the paint area too, besides degreasing all the metal parts. I wish I had, uh, the house I used to own, I had a, a old-fashioned utility sink in the garage and boy that was great because I didn't have to bend over as much and I just put it right in that sink with a rubber mat. And, I rinse the body off the paint quite a few times as I go in case I overspray onto it and stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's turn this around now. And again, I like to keep the body the uh, hand wheel end lower and I'm going to spray the whole bottom of the machine here and up into those motor area and the wire connections and the shafts rocker shaft and so forth and I'll give it a good scrub up here Okay. Now let's go ahead and rinse that first first one off here. So those of you who visited my channel a few times, you've probably seen a video like this. Those of you who the first time are experiencing a crazy guy washing his sewing machine in the shower. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you might be a little surprised, but I've done dozens of these machines uh, like this and never had a problem. You see the hand wheel area? Yeah. Just get in here and spray down through where the motor comes up. And I'm going to go back to my wheel brush. That just works better. Lift up the bobbin winder. and Pretty soon I'm going to be doing this body. But I want to get all of the main metal areas, so to speak. Okay, so. Let's turn it on its side like this for a minute. This area down here, I don't pre-treat, and it's very dirty. I'm not sure if you're able to see it, but I'm going to go ahead and spray this part now in the wire terminal area. And see if just using this, yeah, see it's coming right off. That's, that's usually the experience. It looks terrible. But if you spray it, this is just the 15% and you give it a light brushing, all that gunk comes off. And in case you're wondering, when, when you're done here, you just rinse out the bathtub and it, it gets actually pretty, pretty clean. My wife was kind of panicked the first time she saw me doing this. That tub better be clean when you're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh... I'm going to uh, flip the machine over and do the other part of the base, just what you saw me there, okay? Then I'll show you how to do the outside painted area. Okay, let's do the body now. And this is just going to strictly, I'll do the front here for you, but it's strictly going to be a spray on, a light brushing, and rinse off. Like that. Get this uh, tension area. Now around the base of the up upright, there's always this what I call the dirty collar. 
you get this you get up around this light fixture around the tension unit mm -hmm. the bed what I'm talking about is this area all the way around the oil sits there for years and sometimes I've had to spray and brush it a few times to get it out and uh, a sticker brush like a toothbrush can help you with that but I want I want to rinse this now Mm -hmm. Let me rinse that. I'll go get my little container of 50% solution and we'll get that dirty collar area. Okay, let's try the 50% down there on that dirty collar. Yeah, that's, that's working a little bit better. Now you can come back afterwards. Well, we'll, we'll get to that. I'll, I'll show you later when it's dry and you're starting to do the oiling. If you see little places that you missed, don't panic, okay? Okay. Then... Let's get the wire terminal areas here and now the back side of the machine. Okay. Scrub that. The collar back here is a little dirty. It looks pretty good. Now you got to do, don't forget the underside of the arm and the back of the nose area here. Okay. And around the light fixture. Let's see what the back side of this, I think I already did. Right. Okay, so one last rinse here. Now there's no, you know, there's no time limit on this um, washing. The only thing is just not to let the solution sit on the paint too long. But if you have to spray it, scrub it, rinse it, and then say, oh, I better, I better spray it and scrub it again, that's fine. That's not a problem. Now, let's see because I sprayed underneath those lifters. Let's see if I can... Yeah, they're still stiff. Yep, it's frozen now. <laughs> I can't, I can't turn the, I can't turn the shaft or the needle bars or anything. So, that's to be expected. Don't worry about that. We set the machine aside here. And uh, I'll show you what came out of this machine. See how dirty that is? Wasn't even that dirty of a machine. So I'm going to empty that, rinse out the tub, and put the machine back up on the bucket and get my leaf blower to start the drying process. Okay, I've got my leaf blower. I'm ready to go. I'm going to dry this machine like crazy with the leaf blower and then uh, take it back to the workbench and use a hair dryer to finish it uh, if needed and uh, I'll turn the volume off on this and, and I'll clip it to, to be shorter but these little clips you're going to see me drying it you'll spend more time than that okay
Okay, I have that uh, very dry. I am going to go ahead and uh, prepare the workbench and put this back on the bench uh, for the hair dryer to finish up here. Okay, I have the um, clean machine back on the workbench to start using the hair dryer just to be sure that I get any water hidden in the different areas, which is a definite possibility. And uh, it also gives me a chance for a closer inspection of the machine. And uh, I have good news. There's some flash rust on the machine. Yay! <laughs> I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it here. But there is some uh, rusty spots. So, uh, why is that good news? <laughs> well, I mentioned earlier in the video the possibility of flash rust. And uh, the product that I use to uh, remove that rust. So, I will be able to give you a demonstration of that. So, uh, when, if and when, it happens to you on your machine, you'll know not to... Uh, Oh boy, it's barely turning. Okay, good. <laughs> it was frozen earlier. Uh, you'll be able to to work with that. Okay, so let me get my hair dryer here. And I'm going to start uh, blowing that. I'll just give you some short clips of that with no sound. But I usually uh, put the control on high temperature, uh, you know, hot, and uh, uh, the highest volume of air that I can. Um, I, wa I want to mention, I'm going to pay particular uh, attention to areas that I know go to the heavier bushings, like the arm shaft bushings. This oil port right here is goes to the main bushing for this end of the horizontal arm. And there's one up at this end too, okay? And then uh, on the feed rock shaft, there's a port up here. And then the upper oil port for the vertical shaft is here. And the lower one is down here. And then there's a two oil ports for the two bushings on the lower a horizontal shaft going over to the hook. And those can trap water, you know. And uh, the washing and everything that we did flushes out the oil. And those uh, locations I just gave you for those bushings, two, four, six, uh, plus this one, are usually why your machine will freeze up. So even though the take-up lever over on this end has many oil locations and the bottom we can look at, those six on a machine like this... Uh, uh, are the more critical ones that we want to be sure are dry. So I'm going to blow the whole machine, but I'm going to kind of spend some extra time on those kind of oil ports. Okay.
this point I'm going to take my light bulb out and uh, blow in there to be sure that that area gets nice and dry, the contacts in there. I'm going to do the wire terminals here also. The nose area of the machine. Now I'm going to attempt to turn uh, <clears throat> the arm shaft, if I can, to just move these parts a little bit. Because if you can move them a little bit while you're blowing air, uh, yikes, <laughs> then that, that helps get the water out of there quicker. Now, let's go over and look at the bottom of the machine. I'm sure there's probably going to be a little rust down there, too, if the top rusted like that. Uh, there's minor, minor rust here on the bottom of the gear. This uh, rocker shaft is brown, so that looks... I don't know if that's rust or just the way the metal looks without any oil on it. Let's see. Mm, yeah, there's a little rust on there. So we'll get all of that once I get everything dry. I want to dry this back of the wire terminal here and for the the line feed terminal up there behind the motor bracket and get those nice and dry. So, spend whatever time you can afford to and what you think is required to get everything uh, nice and dry. Now, if I didn't have rush, uh, rust, at this point, I would put oil in the main bushing points I talked about, and then I'd put grease on all the gears. The problem that what I found out was if you get any oil at all on the gear the grease will not stick to it so after I get some oil in those main bushings I usually put grease on uh, all six of these gear sets the, the four gears down here and the two up above okay then once I get the grease on there I start oiling the the other points as shown in the instruction uh, manual for oiling but in this case uh, we want to get the rust off. If we have rust, we want to remove that first because 
the rust remover does not work very well if there's oil on the metal. You know, it like shields it from the rust remover, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. So I'll set the product I use, the must for rust. If you have a rust remover that you like and you do have some flash rust, just use whatever rust remover product that you like. I just take another one of these little plastic cups and put a little bit in here. Don't need a lot of this for this kind of flash rust. And it smells kind of an odd musty smell too. So if, if, you, if that uh, bothers you at all, get some ventilation. You know, if you're in a bigger open space or you're outside, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, I have a fan set up on a bookcase on the other side of the room behind me and I just put it on low speed to just keep the air moving a little bit. So I'm just going to get some of this on a, on a soft like watercolor brush. Now some people uh, just put a sock on their finger and use it like a little sock puppet <laughs> and and you know get some on the tip of their fingers like and then and apply it that way but I just use a little brush like this so I'm, I'm not even sure how much of this rust is going to show to you it's always hard for me to tell in this little viewfinder I know this you can tell is rusty looking but there is a little bit of rust up here and I literally just brush this on the the gears and just a very light coating is going to dissolve all that rust just like that that's all it takes because this isn't something that's been rusty in the basement for 20 years you know there wasn't any rust really on this machine but now it's just a flash rust so I'm going to come over and Put that on the hub of these gears which usually show some rust now a lot of times you can just oil um, you know this kind of rusty thing like this just put rag on an oil and, and rub oil on it and it will remove a lot of that rust but this method I just like when I found it the same same thing I researched um, rust products and I went up to the store to buy one that I'd read about that had some good reviews and sitting right next to it was this crud cutter must for rust so I bought it I just said well hey I like their degreaser so I'm going to give that a try and it works uh, I'm very happy with it so I've never even tried a different product so for me it's fabulous but as I said, it's the only rust remover I ever tried. So if you have one you like, go go use it. Not a problem. If you don't have one, you can try just putting oil on a, on a rag or a sock and just rubbing down this stuff. But keep oil off the gears if you do that. Okay? So I'm just oiling the... I mean, I'm just brushing this rust remover on this shaft a little bit. I see rust up here on this side, so, and, and just, I mean, just brushing it on a little bit like that is all you have to do usually with this rust remover, and because, because it is just a flash rust. Now, let's see how this thing looks. If this isn't rust, it's not going to hurt anything to use it, okay? But it's just, I've never seen one brown like this after washing. And I usually don't have much rust on, on these old, you know, they look more like some type of iron. Uh, they're not stainless steel or anything. But this one is, I don't know if it's just the type of metal they use. I don't know why that one got so rusty compared to the lower one. But it looks like it's changing colors in here. So I am putting this on a little bit thicker because it's not a polished steel. 
like the gear or the uh, shaft was. So the places, you, you just want to look everywhere for any rust like that. I'm not going to make you watch me do the whole machine, but I want to mention a couple things. Back in here um, is a counterbalance on the end of the, uh, let's see if I can get a light in there. And I think you'll be able to see that has got a little rust on it, you know. Okay, so you've seen that rust. I'm just going to do a little tour of the machine and show you some other places the rust is. And there's no need for you to continue watching me to apply the rust. But you'll see up here now all this area has some flash rust, including the gear. So even though we can't see it very well, the gear down in here probably has it too. The main shaft up here, this is where I most frequently get a little rust is this shaft and sure enough there's rust on it let's go look at the nose examine that real quick and I'll get a little bit of extra light here maybe and I really don't see a rust problem up here this time mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe very light inside there so I'll I'll probably do a little bit there and then let's take a look at the hook which I usually don't have a problem with and uh, whoa and all that brown dirty oil and um, yeah dirty oil <laughs> is gone look how nice that um, feed dog cleaned up and everything so I don't have any rust here I won't be needing it so in these other areas I'm going to go ahead and apply the rust remover and when that's done then we'll start oiling the machine okay so I'll see you when we're ready for that okay now that I've got all the flash rust removed and all that cleaned off I'm gonna go ahead with the first oiling and as I mentioned before, I'm going to do these big uh, shaft bushings. And, you know, you'll notice in your uh, instruction manual when it talks about oiling, a lot of times they'll show one or two or maybe three drops um, in each spot when you oil. And by the way, if you need an instruction manual for your Singer machine, you can go to singer.com slash support. <clears throat> and there's a search box. You put your model number in. You don't need any uh, uh, letters. And uh, chances are good that it'll come up with a PDF file you can download that's a copy of the original manual. So anyway, they'll show you like one or a couple of drops. But when you wash and dry a machine like this, you've drained most of the oil out. And uh, these bushings have a capacity for a lot of oil. So there's 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I think you're getting the idea. On these type of a oil port like this, let me move this over a little. Um, I'll I'll put the tube in there and just slowly start filling it up until I can see the oil up at the top here. <laughs> and if if later when when the, the machines are all, all oiled up and moving freely, uh, I might even have to add more. But if some, uh, oh, see, now the machine has frozen again. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if that happens, don't, like I said, don't, don't panic. Okay? <laughs> um, 
the oil can even kind of leak out of, of these bushings a little bit. And that's okay. It's, it's only oil. You can wipe it up with a rag later. But you want to be sure uh, after a wash and dry that you give it plenty of oil. So I usually, uh, when they have a port like that, I usually fill it up, as I said. Okay, let's go over to the main bushing oil port on this side and let's just go ahead and start filling it up. There you go. Uh, now in later models, uh, you're not, your, your uh, instruction manual may just show you to oil the needle bar because there's a lot of plastic in the newer machines, you know, but on a vintage machine like this, just look where those shafts are. You know, you get your arm shaft, upper arm shaft, you got your vertical shaft, and you have your hook shaft down, down below here. And you want to get those filled back up with plenty of oil. And that's usually those are what is preventing the machine from turning. So that's why I go ahead and uh, start getting oil back in there. And you'll notice on some of these uh, how far, like let me, let me show you this one. That's how far the tube goes in to get down to the bushing, right? But look on this, this lower one here. Uh, it's got kind of an entry port and then a little tunnel down, and it only goes in about that far, you know? So if you happen to have uh, oil with a spout, a, a tube like this, go ahead and stick the tube in uh, as far as you can. Now these two holes back there are for attachments, but this one closer uh, to the hook is, is for the bushing on the hook drive. So we'll go ahead and do that. Yeah. Hmm. Really? It's a pretty big one. And that's taking a lot of oil. Maybe it's making a big puddle down below, huh? <laughs> okay, let me just wipe up the oil I spilled. Now, since I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put a drop of oil in the actual shaft port on the hook. There's a little tiny hole on the side of the shaft that lets that oil go down into a bushing that's down there. And a lot of times people forget this and they'll say they have a noisy hook. You know, their hook is real noisy and it's actually just dry. <laughs> so if you see a uh, oil port on your hook, be sure to do that, okay? So one, two, three, four. So I've got those main sets of gears up there with that uh, oiling, okay? And I'll get that soaking in there and maybe that'll loosen up uh, everything here and we'll be able to turn the shaft again later. Now I'm, I'm going to show you how I grease uh, one set of these gears in case you've you've never oh there it is leaking you see that that's funny now I've got some oil coming out the bottom here I thought wow that that one's taking a lot of a lot of oil <laughs> okay hmm remember me mentioning the cleaner wax <laughs> That's why you get oily fingerprints and stuff from working on the machine, so you use a cleaner wax. Anyway, I was going to show you uh, how to, how to uh, grease one set of these gears, okay? Now, this will be just a light primary greasing uh, because they don't rotate right now. Remember, the machine is frozen. 
So I used this uh, clear synthetic grease I, I showed you before at the beginning of the video. And let's see, where's a, here's a stiffer acrylic brush I'm going to use to apply the oil. So usually you can just uh, put on small amounts like this and wipe it into the teeth. Okay, And usually if you put the grease on one gear and then you're rotating the hand wheel, rotating, rotating, it spreads to the other gear. Since these, uh, I can't rotate anything, everything's frozen up again, I'm just going to put some light, light uh, dabs of this on the brush. You know, just, just a little bit. And you want it on the teeth only. Any grease that's not on the teeth is wasted. So I'll just go around as best I can and get some grease on there. So later, when those bushings free up and I can start uh, rotating stuff, that'll spread around. And I can come back and, and catch it some more. So I'm going to do that grease to the other gears okay and then we'll continue to oil the other oiling por ports on this machine okay I have the first coat of grease on the gears I'm just going to go ahead now and start oiling in the nose uh, you know following again the instruction manual about the oil location and uh, I might I might oil and grease the machine like three times before I'm done you know but I like to get this first uh, kind of oiling in here while I'm waiting for the bushings to uh, get soaked in oil and free up and then when I can rotate all this stuff, it'll be easier to make sure I'm getting all the right places. I'm going to go ahead and do the top of the needle bar. And I'm going to do the presser bar bushing. Go ahead and let that get going. And then once in a while, you want to put a drop up at the top of the presser bar on this machine anyway because there's a spring inside. If you don't see a spring outside it means it's in the top of the needle bar. So you just just like once a year I put a drop of oil in there. Okay and then uh, since I washed and uh, degreased in here um, when you're looking in the machine, you'll see the end of this lever on a little block with a slide. And you want to put a little bit of oil in there. I can't show you. It's too dark in there to see this. But if you get your little flashlight and stuff on this type of machine, you will see metal parts where there's a little block on the shaft. And this um, lever right here goes into kind of a rectangle that's got a groove for the block. There we go. It's getting nice and easy now. Now this is a, an aluminum thumb screw uh, with threads inside. And if you want to, you don't normally oil this, but... Uh, because we stripped the grease, I'm going to turn it all the way left, which is open, and just put one drop up there on that shaft so it'll kind of run down into that thumb screw. And then I can, there we go, and I'll move it up here, and then I can close it, you know, 15, 20 turns, close it all the way, and then back. It's already very loose now and moving easy. This has an oil port on the bobbin winder spindle, so I will put a drop or maybe two in there. Mm -hmm. Just like that and give it a whirl. This machine didn't have a bobbin winder friction ring or rubber tire, so I'll be adding that. 
And this is not an oil port. This is for the Bob and Winder thread spool pin. <laughs> so you put your thread here on a pin and run it through the tensioner up to the bobbin winder. So I'll be replacing that, but that's just the hole through to the bottom. And my area up here, that uh, rust remover, got all that rust out in there. I think you can remember there was rust back there on the bushing and a little bit on the I mean on the counterbalance and a little bit on the shaft there. That's all cleaned up and gone now. This has a little oil port up here. So I'll put a few drops in there. Normally this is like one drop. And then there's a lightweight bushing here for this rocker shaft. And you just put an oil right there on the end of it. And the same thing goes uh, down here, you put a drop on the end of the shaft, and then there's actually a little hole to get inside that bushing right there. And we'll wipe them. Um, let's see, I did this side. Now I have got some uh, same kind of points to do here, where we've got the little bushing here on the shaft, and we've got on this. Uh, feed dog lifting shaft those two and there's kind of a figure eight of metal here where there's a joint in the front and then back behind it you'll see another joint back there and um, let's see there's one thing that wasn't in the book I like to do here this is the lever the lifting lever for the needle plate positioning bracket and since I got the machine open up there I'm going to put a drop of oil where that the lever up above swivels and hinges on this bracket just to get some uh, get some oil in there okay mm -hmm. okay so that's the normal oiling points for a machine like this and then there's one more uh, a couple more places up here I want to do and that's um, these lifting pins uh, remember they, they were sticky and had, had trouble in the whole lever still having the very uh, very stiff I mean it's working now but man is it stiff you know and it doesn't like like this raised up it doesn't want to go back down so I'm going to put it in the unlock or all the way left position which raises these up and I want to put some oil at the edge of the tube this steel tube goes through an aluminum ear cast into the body that holds the pin and then the pin is hollow and there's a little steel push pin inside. So down in the, that hole with the push pin, I want to put a couple of drops in there for that pin. And then right around the edge of the main lifting pin. Oh, I don't know if you heard that. The little inside pin just went plink and fell down. <laughs> So I'm going to put the drop inside on the top of that little center pin and then I'll put the oil around the edges here and let's see if I can get any more movement out of this now. Okay, that's starting to move. I can see the little pin inside. See if I push this down in there now. Yeah, that one is came up. Sometimes people have taken these apart and they don't put the spring in it. The spring is what pushes it back down. It just feels kind of stiff in here. This is getting loosened up though, before I couldn't even move it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Now it's starting to go down. You see it? 
So we've got all the bad stuff out of there, and it's dry as a bone. And the, the tolerances here are very close. Everything's a tight fit on a sewing machine. So that's why we need to get some fresh oil in there. Now it's doing much better. Okay. Yay. Okay. And then uh, let's look at that that bracket on the bottom here. There's there's really nothing in the user's manual about oiling it or greasing it. But I'll tell you where this lever, steel lever, it slides through a slot in the aluminum part here. Right there. And I like to uh, lift the lever up and then on this side of the bracket there I like to put just a little bit of grease because that's a that's a resistance point okay for um, this bracket sliding there see how it's gonna, gonna slide through there now okay and I'm seeing oil coming on the bottom here down through my tube so that's good if those tubes up on top are stuck down at the bottom you can turn the machine upside down and you can put oil on the center pin from below and the other one is back behind this adjusting nut and you can go in from the side and you can get some oil in there like that okay but that is pretty much there we go that's getting a lot better now as that oil soaks in and spreads around this will improve okay just like this uh, stitch length lever and reverse was real stiff when I started now it's very easy it's normal. My bob and winder spindle is free and easy to go, so we're good there. Let's see if I can turn this. Um, now, if I had the hand wheel on here, this would turn easier or be easier to try and turn than just grabbing the end of the arm shaft. But I haven't washed that yet. I like to get this oil because if the machine is stuck, it can take hours for it to get free. So I like to get the oil on all those bushings and everywhere and just let it sit there while I go wash those parts I took off. But look, I'm starting to get some movement. See that? Already, just from getting that oil in there, I'm starting to get some movement. There we go. Once it starts moving, it gets better pretty quickly because the oil is you know rolling around on the shaft and the bushing now okay see so even though it was frozen solid just putting that oil on the bushing areas and then the other little oil points now has got this moving much more free and it's going to get better and better when the singer fellas used to take those old black machines and they come in on trade you know because somebody was buying a new one they often would soak them overnight in a bucket of uh, uh, kerosene and then uh, wipe it all down and then oil the bejeebers out of it and then they'd run it for five or ten minutes just to pump all the gunk out and get the kerosene out and get that oil in there and working like very good so I often do that once I get the machine running I'll just run it on low for minutes and just slowly let it spread all the oil around now I've got the needle bar up here so I'm going to put another drop of oil on the bar itself let it sink down into the bushing and then there was a spot I couldn't see too well before back here I put another drop on these. That's why I said sometimes I'll end up oiling everything two or three times, you know, to uh, to be sure I get everything. Now I can still see. Uh, yep, see it's still going. 
I can still see the oil towards the top of that hole, so I don't need to add any more. Let's look up here at the top. See where I had this filled up to the brim? Now it's it's gone in there. Remember, I just, man, I, I don't know, 40 drops, 50 drops. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 12, 13, 14, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Now it's almost full. <laughs> see? So... If you look at the manual, and normally you put a drop or two, but after you do this type of a cleaning, man, you got to fill that reservoir up with nice fresh oil. Okay. Now let's go in here and see about this one. Same kind of thing. It used up quite a bit of oil. Okay, I'll go into the vertical shower. I still got oil there. Okay, let's see this one. I still see oil there. How about this one? Whoop, right away it's full. And this one, I oiled the whole top of my desk, right? So I don't think I have to oil too much more there yet. All right. Now, uh, years ago, many years ago, I read in the thing that if you're going to put the machine and it's not going to be used for months, that you wanted to take your um, lint brush, you know, that you clean your tension unit with, and you wanted to soak it with oil and brush all the metal parts on the machine. <laughs> And then when you came back months later and you were going to sew, you would, you would take a rag and you'd wipe off all that excess oil, put a little fresh oil on all the normal places and run the machine five minutes. So since I have stripped off all this uh, grease and oil from this machine, and then I, uh, I have, have put uh, new stuff on, and then I... Of course I had to remove the rust what I do is put some fresh oil and brush it on the shafts and levers uh, below and inside and stuff like that just to get a light coating of oil and that's supposed to help prevent grease okay so the purpose of coating all of these uh, shafts and uh, rods, things like that, with oil is just to prevent rust in the future, okay? And this is, uh, mm, I guess you'd say it's optional, but after reading that years ago about doing that to protect. Now in Arizona, you know, it's desert mostly here, especially in the Phoenix area, it is desert. It's the Sonoran Desert, and uh, I'm just going to use plain Singer oil for this. There's no friction involved here, so I'm just using a standard Singer oil. And where's my other? Here's my little uh, brush for brushing on oil. Oh, wait, that's the one. Is that the one? Yeah. So. Uh, I'm just going to do that like they said. I'm just going to put get oil on that brush and I'm just lightly going to coat. Now, not the gears. No oil on gears, but on the shafts that we got all cleaned up and degreased. I'm just going to put a light coating of oil on there. Okay? So if you live in a humid area, a moist area, you live anywhere near an ocean this is a good idea to do maybe like once a year since I can rotate I'm going to rotate that now so I can oil the other side of the shaft okay not on the gears but just on that shaft and a lot of times when you do this that 
that cloudy look uh, from the rust remover will go away. So let's go in and do the hand wheel uh, arm shaft counterbalance up here that I cleaned all that rust off. You'll see it in there. It's a big metal weight in here. It slides over the arm shaft and screws to the arm shaft back inside there. And it had developed some flash rust, so I cleaned it with the rust remover. And now I'll just put a light coating of oil on that. Okay. Now before I button up the machine, when I'm ready to put all the clean covers and everything on, I'll go in and wipe off all these with a dry rag just to remove excess oil. So kind of think of it as a rubbed oil experience <laughs> for this bare metal now. <laughs> right? You have the bronzed oil, bronze light fixture, you know. We're just going to rub it with some oil here. Okay, and I did the nose area again. So let's go down here and do this on these rods on the bottom now. I think I can turn this extra light off a little bit there. How's that look? Yeah. So I'll just uh, stay away from the gears themselves. On the back of the gears, I'm going to put that oil without letting it just a very light coat, uh, staying away from the teeth of the gears. Okay, and then I will put a little oil on that needle plate bracket, positioning bracket. Mm -hmm. Just a light coat. And I'll put it on this hook drive shaft here. Mm -hmm. Turn the So any bare steel or iron, you don't need to oil aluminum, okay? The, this body's cast aluminum and you don't need to put any oil on it because it's, it's not going to rust. Aluminum doesn't really rust. I think it can oxidize, but it's not going to rust. And then these... Remember how this one was all brown before? I cleaned it with the rust remover. Mm -hmm. Now it just looks clean. It looks dark like the other one. Get up in here. Get down on the back side. I'm kind of slathering this on here because this metal is a little more porous than the polished steel. So what doesn't soak in, again, when I go to close up the machine, I'll, I'll wipe off the excess. Okay. Now, if you can, uh, up inside is the feed rock shaft and the feed rock lifting shaft. That's what moves the feed dog, okay, is these two. See, one creates an oscillating mo movement to move the feed dog front to back, and the other raises it up and down, okay? And by cleaning that off in there, we've, we've left the metal bare, and I like to just uh, go up in there and reach up in there and just put a little oil on that chef. With a, with a brush this size, you can reach all the way up to the bottom of the arm shaft up on top. And just drag that brush over the, the uh, these lifting rods here that come down from the the upper arm shaft. Okay, so you get a, a, some protection on those. Mm -hmm. Those usually don't get that dirty up in there. 
but because I sprayed the cleaner up in there, you know, I want to uh, clean that. And then I dried it. Didn't have any rust, so I'm just putting a light coat of oil on it. Okay. You'll see this uh, grease stick up off of the gears like that. Mm -hmm. When I first run it, I run it slow so that uh, the, the grease will melt a little and get in between the teeth. You know, you don't put fresh grease on and then run it full blast. Even though this grease clings better than a lot of other ones that I've tried, if you just put on fresh grease like this and slam the foot pedal, uh, it's just going to toss a lot of it off onto the air other parts, <laughs> which is just going to collect dirt and gunk, and it's not going to be protecting your uh, gears, you know. These gears get very hot, even your, even they're greased perfectly. And this grease can take some very high temperatures, but I will tell you, those gears get hot. So we need good grease protection on there. And uh, I would do this a couple times a year. See how it's poking up now? See how it tends to come down to this point right here and and uh, it's kind of being pushed down like that. That's real normal, so I'll just turn it a few times and spread it around some more. And uh, turn it some more. And here we see it clinging to the edge, getting pushed out. Okay, now this, this gear on this side and if you have a hook gear system, you might encounter this on your machine. Uh, it's harder to get to this, these gears because the, they face in, <laughs> you know. But uh, you can go through this port here and you can get to the teeth of the gear in there like that. Okay. And... Uh, if you're doing this like six months from now, you'd want to take the toothbrush and, and kind of uh, brush off the old gear, right? The old grease. Get off the old stuff as much as you can, kind of dry brush it there, and then brush on a little bit more to replace it. But you usually won't need this much because you'll, you'll still have grease on it even after you brush off quite a bit. But since we degreased everything, and in the uh, instruction manuals for a machine like this, you might just see where they show, just put a little dollop of grease on one of the gears, and that's it. Because as it turns, the gear ratio, it will spread that between all the teeth, between the two gears. Okay, so, glad we did that a little bit better. It's come a long way already without dismantling a whole bunch of parts. Now that we have it washed and dried and lubricated, wow, it's already, yeah, a lot smoother already. That's great. Um, I have to clean all of these parts that I took off. I have the arm cover, the nose cover, the plates, the slide plate, and the needle plate. I got the uh, dirty old hand wheel here. And uh, I've got that nasty looking uh, oil pan thing to look at. And I'll show you, uh, you know, we can brush that or we can clean it with the crud cover. I'll show you both ways. Okay, so that's what's going to be next is uh, washing the parts that uh, we took off. Okay, before, um, before I head off to the sink to wash the parts I took off, I want to just discuss this uh, bedpan for a minute. 
it's actually called a bed plate sorry like a bed cover plate we call it the oil pan or the drip plate and uh, if this can have a tendency to soak up a lot of oil over the decades and smell pretty bad <laughs> and when you're sewing and the, everything gets warmed up on the bottom of the machine from the gears and everything the smell can increase and uh, you know there's a little fan in the motor that pulls air in from the right side of the machine and and kind of blows it up into the motor and that can seep out of the top of the machine and smell bad so if it does smell bad we clean it with a crud cutter um, if it doesn't smell bad and you just want to clean it and get rid of all this lint you can see I kind of cleaned this half of it this one doesn't smell bad so I use I, I, I would not normally clean it with the crud cutter but I am going to just to show you how to do it but uh, the whole thing was like this dirty and you can see it here so if you don't want to wash it don't care to you can brush off most of this gunk I just use a couple of types of brushes um, the thing is it's fragile and if you brush hard it's going to uh, damage it you know <laughs> And so you just gently uh, brush off as much as you can of the lint and, and so forth. If you have a big glob of grease there, you're going to want to try and scrape it up with a flat edge like a popsicle stick uh, or a knife blade even. Just, just remembering this is kind of like a tar paper uh, absorbent pad so to speak so you don't you don't brush it hard you just kind of gently you know uh, brush it towards the closest edge now the other thing is I have a, a uh, lint brush that you know when you when you brush it one way it picks up lint and then you brush it the other way on a different cloth to clean it and these these work uh, pretty good too. Let me switch this around and I'll I'll show you that. You just remember not to apply too much pressure. And here's a little spot up here where the surface has been uh, punctured. And I'll, sh I'll try and show you that up close. See? Um, it's like something got under there and raised that up. And then it ripped. Um, you can see built up grease over here. Now you can go around just with a rag. And let me, let me do that. I still have a little bit of that 50% cleaner left. So... Uh, I'll just dip a rag. You can go around the edges and clean off the muck uh, like this as best you can. You know, over here is always a little dirty area. So you can kind of spot clean it like that. Um, and the same thing on the back. Usually the back, just a damp cloth will do it. Uh, but as I said, I will show you in the in the video how to clean the whole thing with crud cutter. Um, but then you have to even be more careful because this is even more fragile when it's wet. So you'll see that when I do it. So I go set up at the sink and we're going to clean all these other parts I, I uh, took off. Okay, I'm set up at my washing parts washing station aka kitchen sink <laughs> and I've got all the parts over here I want to clean I've got them on a towel for draining and uh, I've got my trusty mm, hair dryer ready to dry them and so forth so the first thing I wanted to talk about was this uh, bed plate the old oil pan thing drip plate and if if it is nasty smelling, 
I just spray it with this same solution I used in the shower, a 15% uh, crud cutter to water. And I'll just spray it down real good like this. Soak it pretty good and that, that pad that absorbs oil is going to absorb a lot of that. So I'll set it over here to just set it flat and work for a little bit. And then I've got all of my metal parts that I took off and I'm going to uh, soak those in my dish soap. So I'll just take my parts container and I'll put a squirt of dish soap in there and put enough water to cover them up let them soak get any grunge off of there while I'm here I want to just clean the exterior of this motor a little bit now of course we don't want any water getting into the motor there's the ventilation there's the fan and we don't want it getting in up in here any kind of a cleaner or degreaser or soap because right at the top of this is a bearing ball bearing system that supports the motor shaft so if the pinion gear here that mates up with the hand wheel if it's grungy and dirty you can uh, do that dry brush where you try and brush off the excess and then I would just kind of leave it at that get off as much of if there's any old gunk if there's something uh, you know that white lithium grease that dries like a rock <laughs> uh, if it's on there you're gonna have to scrape it and so forth but really avoid getting anything down in here okay uh, wire brushing that's okay you can use a stiffer wire brush this is a you know metal and then as far as the uh, body this part up in here that goes in that tube you can see some discoloration on it uh, it's not really too bad on this one but I wipe off the excess with uh, an old rag and then I'm going to dip this rag in some of that 50% solution that I had left and just uh, carefully kind of spread that around and let it soften up that uh, old dried up oil or grease that's on there this way I could you know I'm not flooding it I'm not spraying it I'm not letting it get onto that uh, bearing up there and I, I'm speaking from experience about that one time when I just sprayed the outside and I got a bunch mm -hmm. of crud cutter up in there and boy the motor was clean but when I went to run it it sounded like a cement mixer or something the bearing that uh, didn't have any grease anymore <laughs> and man it was terrible that really ruined the engine I mean the motor so I think you get the idea there about cleaning that off as much as you can then I'm just gonna fill the sink with some soapy dish water here okay Now, you don't need a lot of water, just a couple inches will do. And I'm going to put these uh, metal parts that I took off down in there to start uh, soaking a little bit. And my nose cover, arm cover, the lampshade, and the hand wheel. Uh, this, this part of the hand wheel is usually the hardest part of it to clean. But I am going to uh, go ahead and soak it in here. I can use some of the crud cutter if I have to. 
while I'm letting that soak a little bit I'm going to come over here now and rinse off my uh, bed plate and I just hold it uh, kind of at an angle and just rinse it with room temperature water And I can see in the sink that not much oil is coming out. When these are really dirty, you'll see the brown water coming out of here like crazy. Okay. Now you don't want to brush this or scrub it when it's wet. Okay. I can work a little bit more on this dirty corner here. Okay, that's below the hook gear area. That's why that usually gets kind of dirty. Okay. Now, the first time I did this, if you can you can see when this is wet like this, it it gets a little bit warped. Okay? And if you let it soak too long and you wash it too much, the whole thing can get loose and if that happens pull it up let it dry and put some craft type glue uh, underneath to glue it back down but if you don't overdo it just put the stuff on for a minute or two and rinse it off the first time I dried it with a blow dryer and it and it stayed puckered up it stayed you know uneven like this so ever since then, I just, uh, usually I take it outside and I just put it on a flat surface and I let it dry. I let it completely dry before I put it back on the machine. Okay, so I wouldn't use the hair dryer on this. Just lay it someplace flat and let it dry if you do wash it at all. Okay. Let's go take a look at my uh, parts. I forgot to mention this, a little strainer so I can rinse the small parts. I want to take a look at these uh, metal parts that I have left soaking here. I've got my brush and sponge if I need them. And uh, sometimes these really just soak them and rinse them is all it's going to need. Okay, but sometimes there's built up gunk on them, so you got to brush them or mm, uh, scrub them a little bit. I put them in here so I can rinse them easily. Let's see another part in there I can show you. Yeah, here's the stop motion screw gets stained up in the back here. So I'll scrub that up a little bit. I can use my whoop, I can use my wire brush on anything that's stubborn. Okay. So you get the idea of that, right? Oh, wait, I do want to show you this because this can get gunky. You see that big dark spot of dried oil? Uh, when you're not using the crud cutter and you're soaking it. You can soak these longer than I did, but the wire brush will help you clean off that built up stuff if you're just using dish soap. If you want to clean these parts with uh, your crud cutter, you can, you can just spray them. I lay them all out in the bottom of the sink and spray them and let them sit for a while and then usually you can just rinse them off. Okay but I just wanted to show this time because a lot of people tell me they cannot get crud cutter and they use different kind of dish soaps and cleaning soaps on the machine in the shower and dish soap on parts like this once I have these uh, all scrubbed up and clean 
I'll just put them all in the strainer to rinse them off. Of course. Then I will put them over here on my towel to start drying. And then I can work on the arm covers. Now the painted stuff usually cleans up very well. I just run a sponge over it and usually that is all you need except I don't know if you remember at the top edge of the front of the machine we had this kind of uh, just like the dirty collar on the upright this built up oil right along the edge so that I almost always have to scrub with uh, you know one of these nylon kitchen type scrubbies or take a, a wire brush to it to get that off that built up dried oil I think I can see why the singer guys used the uh, the kerosene on those old machines that, that came back as trade-ins. <laughs> Probably had a lot of old gunky oil on them. Okay, uh, I'll put these aside here so I can rinse them all at once. Uh, the, same, the same thing with the nose cover and the lamp shade. You don't need to see that. Okay, I, I've got everything else scrub down I'm at this uh, hand wheel now and we're going to look at this built up gunky area here we can try our kitchen sponge and it's, it's working since that's been uh, soaking for a while in the dish soap that's working real good sometimes I've had to take a, a wire brush to that Okay, but that's actually coming right off. We'll do around the front side in the clutch area. Okay, then I'm just going to rinse all these parts to get the soapy water off, and I'll lay them over on my drying towel. Okay. So when I get that set up, I'll show you that. Then I wanted to show you uh, in particular about the hand wheel. Um, Back beside here, there's a there's a spring in there. Can you see how that twists and spring? That's so you don't get a jarring start or stop when you're sewing. But moisture can get in there on that spring. So this is something that we want to dry very well. And then, of course, I'm going to continue drying all of these uh, painted parts, the arm covers and stuff, nose cover that I took off. But they mostly have drip dried now, so they'll dry real quick. And if I get little water spots, that'll come off with the waxing. Okay, so I'm going to finish drying these up, and I'll see you back at the workbench. Okay, look at all these nice, clean, odor-free parts <laughs> after our trip to the washing sink. They came out nice. Um, what I will do on some of the parts is the same that I did on the machine after degreasing it. And I'll just take my 
uh, Singer oil and I'll put a light coat of oil on some of the parts that I feel would be prone to rusting a little bit in the future. Um, as with the machine, the bright metal parts don't need this. But I have seen rust come on this uh, motor retention bracket. So I'll just slather a little bit of oil on here. And uh, since I'm going to start uh, reassembling the parts, I'll go ahead and uh, wipe off the excess oil. So I just leave a sheen, just a little um, just a little coating for protection. So I'm going to do this on some of the other dark metal parts here that I uh, cleaned, like the thumb nut on the bottom and these screws. And uh, then I'm going to start uh, reassembling the the machine and I'll show you the process kind of like how I go about that and uh, I cleaned the outside of the motor I, I showed you in the video and it came out nice so once I get the rest of these oiled up and the desk rearranged here I'll show you some assembly okay I'm going to just lay the machine back on this towel little protection there oops and I'll put one of my blocks under here and I'm going to put in the motor first because I want to uh, go ahead and put the motor and hand wheel and run the machine the way the singer guys told me they did to get that oil and grease really uh, circulated and make sure Everything sounds good before I start uh, waxing the parts in the machine up. Now, one thing that I will do is, uh, before I put the motor in, if, if you're working on this type of a slant needle machine, I recommend this to put some grease on the pinion gear because it... Uh, it's easier to do it here <laughs> than when it's in the machine, you know. So I'll just take some and just gently put it around on this a little bit. And I will be putting grease on the texto light gear of the hand wheel too that this mates with. So you don't need to put a big old glob or anything here just a touch now I'm going to slide this motor up into the tube pull up my connection wires out of the way and just kind of wiggle that up and make sure it's uh, seated now one thing to get the best connection with the hand wheel gears when this is in Put your thumb up on one of the brush covers and push the top of the machine uh, of the motor over to the right. Okay, so just just like that. And then I remember that my black wire was on the right pin, so I will. I guess you can't see that in there too good. I can't see it that good myself. <laughs> Okay, and then the brown wire on the left. You know, it really, uh, on this machine, it doesn't really matter when you do that. I've seen these with two black wires and one black and one red. And I've played around with them reversing the wires. And it doesn't really have an effect because the plug is not polarized. You know, like if I reverse these two wires... It wouldn't matter, and the motor's not going to run backwards or anything like that, you know. Uh, okay, so I'm going to put my motor retention bracket in now that uh, slides up here and fits right up like that. 
I'll take my bracket mounting screw which I put a little oil on. I'm going to put just a little bit more on the threads. These type of screws I usually just put a little bit of oil on before I put them back in uh, with the intention that if they ever have to be taken out um, they'll come a little easier. Now when you go to put this in when you look from here you can't see the hole but if you peek around the edge of the bracket uh, when the machines in front of you you can see the hole to get the screw started in there. Now once you get it you can make it uh, finger tight and then just a, f just a little bit more then finger tight. Uh, I've had these screws put in so hard they I broke one trying to take it out. But it, it doesn't like hold the motor up. It just puts pressure on the side of the motor so that it, the motor won't fall down. So you just have to snug it up. You don't don't bear down or crank down on it. Okay. So there's my motor reinstalled. And then, as I stated, before I put the hand wheel in, I'm going to put a little bit of that grease around on the Textilite gear. This gear is the only non-metal gear that I put grease on. I don't think I mentioned earlier, I do not grease plastic or nylon gears. And I, I know that some people agree with me and some people don't and uh, the reason I never had is the singer guys told me no and they said if you look at any of our manuals you never see it showing where it shows put oil here and put grease here the only gear it ever said to put grease on was this one now I have on some of the newer models for me that I worked on where the pinion gear on the arm shaft of course is metal but the gear on the base of the cam stack is plastic so you've got a plastic gear mating with a metal gear just like on this hand wheel to motor shaft uh, mate and there's usually factory grease there and after I clean it out I replace it with this uh, tri-flow synthetic grease. I think I'll put just a little bit touch more of that. And this is another uh, gear that once or twice a year I just take a dry toothbrush and turn the handle and brush off all the teeth and then I'll just put a little uh, grease on about an inch and turn it 180 degrees and put grease on another inch or so and uh, more more grease than I did this time and that will spread to the pinion gear okay so uh, to put this back on this type of motor uh, the same kind of thing I'll uh, whoops you know what I forgot I like to put a little bit of oil uh, on this um, bushing that the hand wheel mounts on because in uh, bobbin winding mode the hand wheel spins on that and does not turn the, the arm shaft to make the needle bar and feed dog and hook move so I'll, I'll put some drops of oil up there and I'll just uh, spread it around. Now don't put a ton of oil because you can actually get like a hydroplane or an oiloplane. <laughs> and uh, if you get too much in there, when you're winding the bobbin, there's enough pressure between this and this that it'll grab it a little bit and your your needle bar will kind of creep up and down. So put some oil on just for a 
lubrication. And you want to wiggle this back in there to get it meshed with the motor, okay? And all, all the way on. Then we'll take our clutch washer and with the with the pins facing us, I'll put it on. You have a 50% chance of getting it right. Basically what you want to end up with is when you put the stop screw on, didn't that come out nice? Well, when you put the stop screw on, the stop set screw, which I'm just going to barely get started there, has to end up between two of those little pins sticking out. So if it if it gets right up next to one, you won't be able to loosen the pressure on the washer. So we'll just try it here. And the way I happen to put this on, let's turn it here. I can see behind the edge of this I have an ear here or a pin and one here. So I'm good. I'm I'm between them. So I got the washer on the correct way. If not, I'd have to unscrew this, turn the washer 180 degrees, put it back on, and reinstall the stop screw. This way I have room before the pin to turn it like this to clamp on the washer so now it will turn the needle bar and the hook this is called sewing mode right but if I hold the hand wheel and turn the stop screw counterclockwise I have room for it before it hits the stop that little pin but now I can the motor can turn the hand wheel to run the fiction ring and the bobbin winder without the hook or the needle moving. So I got that on properly. Okay. And the reason I'm doing this first, as I said, was to hook back up the electricity and run the motor for a while. I want to see how I did. I want to make sure it runs smoothly, that I don't hear any metal on metal. Like maybe I forgot to, you know, I forgot to oil one of the bearings or something and it's sluggish. And I hear, uh, you know, something like that. Sorry, I haven't practiced my metal on metal sound effects lately. Maybe that's better. <laughs> Okay, let me plug in the foot pedal here and I'll plug in the line cord to my power strip. Nothing blew up, that's good, no smoke. And I'll put it in bobbin winding mode first to just uh, run the motor a little and test it out. Let's see how it, how it goes. Mmm. Okay, takeoff speed. <laughs> okay, that sounded good. So I'll put it back into sewing mode now and start slow. I'll start slow and see if I don't get uh, some needle and hook feed dog movement now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That sounds great. Let me speed it up a little. Okay, that's actually pretty fast for having uh, degreased it and put some fresh oil and grease on there. So uh, what I'm going to do now off screen is I'm going to run it at kind of a slow to moderate speed about like that 
and just let it sit there and run for five minutes and then we'll take a look at all the oil and grease and if it looks it needs a little more grease we'll add it uh, same with the oil if not we'll uh, start waxing the machine by the way when I when I set this up to run I just put this little um, uh, clamp on here Mm -hmm. There we go. That's about right. Okay. So I'll just let it sit here on the clamp and set a timer for five minutes. All right. Time's up. <laughs> Machine uh, ran very well. And it did pick up some speed as that uh, oil and grease got spread around well. So I'm going to disconnect the wires and set up and we'll take a look at how everything looks inside and on the bottom and so forth. Okay, I'm going to start up here at the top and see how we're looking. I see the grease on the gear has thinned out a little bit on these gears, as I imagined it would. I can see that it's uh, thrown off a little grease and oil from running at the high speed there. So I'll wipe that up. I think I will put on just a little bit more on that gear before I button it all up. I can just spread it around what I can reach here on the top and it will spread itself to the lower horizontal gear. Mm -hmm. And let me shake up my triflow oil and I'm just going to add a little bit. I can see that the rest of the oil has settled and uh, when I moved the machine the other day I had some small puddles underneath it which means that it's uh, you know worked its way through the bushings and has leaked out a little bit so that tells me that I've got plenty of oil in there for that. I don't have any oil accumulated, uh, you, you know, that's going to collect much dirt. I have a little spot here on the arm shaft where my grease brush got a little grease. I don't need it over there on the arm shaft. I just need it on the gears. Okay. I'll come around to the front here now camera down here a little bit and we'll take a look in here mm -hmm. just a couple of spots I want to be sure I have oil on the uh, needle bar connection bracket and this take up lever because they, they just work like crazy. I'll put another drop on the presser bar bushing and a couple of drops on the needle bar to let it leak down into the bushing there. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and exercise that a little bit. I'm going to put one drop up here on the presser bar pressure adjusting thumb screw or knob just to get a little bit of lubrication in there mm -hmm. and then I can see a little spilled oil back in there so I'm just going to wipe up the excess of that and come down 
around the needle clamp where the oil tends to run down and accumulate right down there on the thumb screw area and the top of the needle clamp because I don't need that mm -hmm. and I'm going to put one drop on that hinge or oh, screw that holds the take up lever because it's the metal screw onto the metal lever just put a little drop there very nice let me set this down and uh, lay the machine back down here what happened to my blue towel I must have pushed it right off the back of the workbench here <laughs> and let's take a look down here a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see this? See this area right there? That's when the extra oil has worked out of the bushing. And, uh, and of course, you know, by gravity, it flows down here onto the bottom of the bushing housing. And that's why when we opened up before, these had dark, dark puddles of dried oil. So I'm just going to wipe up that excess off of these. Uh, I got this a little bit heavy, so I'm just going to wipe down the extra oil on these rods. They look great, just kind of like oil rubbed iron now to prevent uh, any extra dust and lint and dirt accumulating. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Now I'm going to put a little bit more grease on these gears. The original grease I put on there has spread around very well. So if you have uh, gears on the machine you're doing, you know that's the idea. After you wash it, you re-lubricate, then you run the machine for a while and you let the oil and grease do its thing and then you may add a little bit more like this just to be sure that it got worked into those teeth on the gears is what I'm trying to do you notice I'm not slathering it on like some videos because that just gets thrown around inside and, and collects gunk I'm going to do the same thing. And remember, no oil on gears. Gears run too hot for oil. And these metal gears need grease. And if you want to grease your plastic gears, uh, use your grease that you think is recommend, recommended. This uh, TriFlow Synthetic Grease does say on its website that it is considered safe for most types of plastic. It does not say don't use it on this type of plastic. <laughs> it just says for most type of plastics. And I, I never worried about it much because I just don't grease uh, plastic gears. Okay. And let me put the cap back on this. Now, I've got a couple little oil spots that I'll just put one a drop or two in the port. This would be kind of like a regular type of maintenance oiling, just a drop or two at these locations is all I'm going to need here. Back on these two little screws and what I call the figure eight. And these little end bushings that move metal on metal. Mm -hmm. Let's see how my yep my bracket works. Okay, and then I'll just come through and just dab up any surface oil that I just spilt on it. So I can put the bottom plate on there anytime I want. I usually I usually wax the bottom of it, bottom plate. So, mm -hmm. so I think that that's uh, that's going to do it. So, 
I'll start with this uh, bobbin case and uh, I will because one of the places you didn't see me oil before because it wasn't here was this race on the hook this little shelf that runs right along the inner edge of the hook so with the bracket retention retention bracket there I'll come in and put that fork on the post and swing it over to the left onto the race I'm just going to hold it here on the top edge and gently turn to make sure it's on the race and I haven't missed it mm -hmm. then I'll move the retention bracket back And get it uh, settled in there and then I'll turn it here okay now where Singer says so they want you to oil the race okay and where where Singer and a lot of their manuals will say to do it is this little opening between the bracket arm and the spring a little rectangular opening and you can see the edge of the race so that's usually where I will put the oil since they recommended it. It is just right there. Because that hook just goes and goes and goes. It's a rotary hook and that race goes through the slots on the bobbin case. So it's just constant metal on metal on metal. Mm -hmm. Now I've also in areas where I can't see that or get to it. I'll just put a drop right where the bobbin case meets the race and if I turn it slowly it'll slide in there a lot of people forget that spot and if you get a uh, kind of noisy what you think a noisy bobbin case or hook it can be that your race is dry Like I can go by my wife's sewing room and hear her sewing on her 301 and I can I can tell. I say, honey, when's the last time you oiled the bobbin race? The bobbin case race. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so don't forget that the hook race for the bobbin case. Okay. Now, let's see how my bracket lifts these up now. Lifts them up well let's see if they drop down yeah okay see before after I first cleaned it and oiled it this one would kind of slowly go down but now it's going up and down pretty good so I'm going to put a drop of oil in the center of this bigger pin there's a hole with a smaller pin with a nipple and I'm going to oil a drop on that inner pin that also moves up and down in there. Where's my drop? There we go. And then I'm going to put a drop of oil right on the edge of the outer pin. Okay. Then I'll do the same with this one. A drop inside, a drop on the edge. And then I'll just exercise this a little bit to make sure because you might go a long time where you don't raise that up halfway for uh, mm, free motion sewing or darning or you want to you want to take out the needle plate you know push it out to clean the feed dog area you might go a long time so having a drop or two of oil in that system is a good idea Okay, then I'm going to take my uh, bed slide, <laughs> the official bed slide or bobbin cover plate, and just going to put a drop of oil in here where it goes onto the spring. 
I've mentioned this phenomena before that when you clean and degrease these and put them back together that it it can kind of drag there doesn't always want to uh, slide as smooth as when you took it off because it doesn't have all the years of oil and lint and stuff on there so I'll just grease that up a little bit and turn the hand wheel until the feed dog is at its lowest point there start back here and slide the plate up to this retention spring and then I'll put a little screwdriver on the edge and lift it up and put that side of the plate over the spring okay and then I'll come and do this side now I have the spring tips into those slots and then I'll slide it forward and there we go pull it to the stop push it close works perfect okay Then using the bracket to unlock the throat plate positioning pins. By the way, this goes on and off from the back. Again with the, uh, let's see, how did they say to do it? I think, I think in the manual it says with this take up lever in the down position. That you slide that you slide the plate on and off. So if you have trouble getting that on and off, it may be uh, the height of the feed dog. It's really what they're saying by lowering the take up level. You're you're getting this feed dog down below the plate so that you can slide your plate on and off. Then when you get it in position, you raise up the lever all the way to the right which is says down and you lower those positioning pins and make sure that your needle plate seated flat there we go okay now I'm not going to put these other other covers on yet because I find that they are easier to wax uh, when they're not on the machine hey <laughs> so, what I am going to do is, in this situation, I start putting cleaner wax on here, and while I'm waiting for it to dry into a haze, I put carnauba wax on the parts I took off, because they don't have any of my greasy fingerprints on them. You know, I just washed them and put them aside. So, I can put the carnauba wax, then go back here and remove the cleaning wax and go back to my parts and remove the wax and so forth. So I'll, I'll show you that set up here in a moment. Okay, I'm ready to start doing some of the cleaner wax uh, on the body. And, um, you know, if, if you don't work as messy as me and you don't have a lot of dirty fingerprints and stuff and you just want to skip the cleaner wax and use your uh, you know your car wax that's fine um, you know it's it's up to you it's, this is just how I've done it for a long time and if you don't have any access to waxes where you're at uh, you can just take a, a plain sewing oil and a, a soft cloth you know and just rub in a very light uh, coating of oil on the body to give it some protection and some shine. You know, Singer knows the machine's going to have oil on it all the time, so oil's not going to hurt anything on the machine. So, um, you know, keep that in mind. If you don't have wax, wax <laughs> excuse me, if you don't have any wax, or you don't want to use the wax. Uh, the nice thing about this uh, cleaner wax that that I like about it is it's a liquid and uh, it goes on real easy 
and it um, it doesn't take much. When I wax, I just use uh, light coats, and this wax can go on anything on the machine, uh, except I wouldn't use it near the uh, tension assembly, and I wouldn't use it on the rubber tire, and on this uh, back collar of of the uh, hand wheel, that's where the the friction ring or rubber tire is going to go. So you don't want wax on your rubber tire or this back edge right there. And you don't want any wax to be on this uh, uh, little thread tension unit for bobbin winding. You know, because you won't, you won't get your tension if it's waxed. But um, the chrome, the paint, uh, these uh, little cover plates, indicator plates, they, they can all be uh, waxed with both kinds of wax. So again, I just put a very light uh, coat of the cleaner wax and um, you know, I'll put some up here around the indicator plate and I'll put some on this one and the chrome knob. And I'm and I'm just uh, looking to get off any thing on the surface that I put on there while I was manipulating it. Do a little bit more here, just just some of these uh, areas. And uh, the other reason I like to wax is because I I have found uh, with feedback from my wife that. Uh, when I started waxing the machines, uh, keeping them clean was a lot easier too. Um, you know, she usually takes a microfiber cloth and wipes down um, the machine after she sews. She'll she'll brush out her tension with uh, you know a, a lint brush, right and brush out the nose area maybe and around here just to keep some of the lint off and then she'll take a microfiber cloth and just kind of dust it off and she said the machine tends to stay cleaner a lot uh, longer when she does that so there's my cleaner wax now usually I would just do the whole waxing at one time uh, and then let it dry and I've even waxed it at night and not buffed it off till the morning and it doesn't doesn't bother it at all then I I would uh, move to like some of these parts that I uh, cleaned I'll show you like this uh, nose plate you know it has a, a natural little shine from the paint but you know over whatever 60 years the paint does ox ox uh, date a little bit and uh, some cleaners can uh, dull the shine a little bit and use so that's why I go ahead and wax these I didn't handle this much after I washed it so that's why I don't use the cleaner wax I just use this uh, pace wax recommendation of a friend and again, I don't, uh, I've had this a long time, um, I don't put a real heavy coat, in my opinion, but, you know, I'll just rub this on, and uh, this takes longer to dry than the cleaner wax. So when I have all these parts, I'll just start waxing them, and I'll go from one to the other to the other to the other. And usually by the time I wax the last one, I'll come back to the first one like this, and it'll be dry enough to buff off, you know. And I wanted to show you the uh, bottom plate, or the oil plate. You know, it uh, flattened back out good. It came clean. I also... Uh, wax this up with uh, the car wax put a protective coat on it 
and uh, there's uh, sometimes I watch uh, sports on TV or listen to the news and you know just music on something like that and wax the machine mm -hmm. it doesn't really take too long you know it's, it's kind of fun it's get it waxed up so all those kind of parts that I took off um, let's see oh I, al I also wanted to show you uh, you know you can you can wax the hand wheel and the knob here and on the back edge but just not that collar that I showed you so here's uh, here's my cleaner wax I'll just put that on there a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you'll get the idea here. Take a, I like to use a cheesecloth to take this stuff off when, when the cl cleaner wax is hazed over and dried. Then I'll use some cheesecloth to get the wax off mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seems like uh, the wax likes to get st stuck in little places so um, after I would wax the final waxing of this I use a toothpick to come and just uh, uh, you know scrape out any little areas that uh, I've shoved wax into <laughs> sometimes in the head of a screw you know around the edge of these indicator plates I'll get a little bit so I'll take that off um, the other thing is too that that I can get wax into these little oil ports and the, the little uh, screw holes for the attachments so I just have some uh, interdental uh, things you would clean like between your teeth you know and I'll use those to to clean out any wax in there. I don't want that clogged up and I don't want a lot of wax to go down in and mix with the oil the next time that I oil the machine. Now after after I would clean do the whole machine with cleaner wax then I do it with the regular uh, car wax and the same thing I, I you know a little goes a long way this is a flat paint and uh, it's very easy to wax it's quick to wax what am I missing here and uh, a little goes a long way you just put a nice coat I usually just start at one one section and you know do that whole little section area move to the next and so forth so we'll let the car wax haze up and dry now which does take a longer as I said and let's go back to this uh, pieces that I put the car wax on first and I'll be the same the same thing I use a cheesecloth to remove the excess wax and do a light buffing like that <laughs> now at this point if I, I I usually do the machine wax it twice with the car wax but once I if I do it once or twice or whatever um, the f after I get the wax off the last time I take it just a soft uh, cotton cloth you know and that's when I rub harder and buff it up to, to get a little bit more shine okay 
See how nice that comes out? And then uh, it'll be the, it'll be the same, you know, with the bottom plate that I put the cleaner wax on. I'll just do part of it here to show you the difference. And this is just the cleaner wax. Uh, after I put the uh, car wax, it'll bring out the shine just a little bit more. But you can you can see the difference. You know, just where I have waxed and 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 uh, it cleans off any little grime and fingerprints and any oil, and uh, it works works well for that. Okay. All right, my car wax is dry where I put it on here, so I'm just buff that off with some cheesecloth. Mm -hmm. Then I'll take a polishing or a buffing cloth whatever you like to use and shine that up mm -hmm. all the little places I put that on I think you I think you'll find it very rewarding <laughs> if you clean a machine like this and then put a coat or two of wax on it. I think you'll be very happy with the with the results. Mm -hmm. Tilt tilt it in the light here maybe so you can see see some of that uh, how nice it shines up. It's nice and clean and uh, brightens up the chrome and the paint and the plastic if you have plastic on the machine anything like that okay there's just a couple things I want to uh, show you here before I put the machine back together and stuff like that and uh, one is how to put this uh, um, nose cover uh, back on if you've never done one of these of this type. So there's little holes right here for a hinge pin and there's a little gap you can see where my fingers going in down here and it has a hole in the bottom part and on the uh, cover these little ears or tabs that stick out they have these little hinge pins and if you have one missing you can cut a new one out of just a finishing nail you know they're just little and to, to put it on there you're just going to kind of line it up you need to start the bottom one in here first because it has a confined uh, space and then that one will start in, let me turn it like this maybe. You get this one back in there and start it in the hole, then you can lower the top down and that's it. Now some of them, like this one, have a, a little spring that catches on the side of the bushing here and keeps it closed. Okay, some do not have that. They have a little pressure button up here that snaps into a spring on the on the arm cover. But on any of them, you need to put the nose cover back on before you put the arm cover back on the machine. Okay. And the last thing I want to do is uh, test the light bulb and make sure that my 
uh, cleaning and watering and drying and all that did not affect the light circuit. Okay, I had, I had to plug the line cord back in to get power up here. Um, this is a bayonet style bulb, meaning it has two little uh, pins that stick up on it. And when you put it in, uh, it won't go into the light socket until you line up those pins with some slots. Then it will go in. And back in here are some contact springs. Uh, soldered on the end of the wires there and you push the bulb in against those springs and then you can push it back no forward back is to remove so then you twist it forward a tiny bit and it locks in okay and let's test it yeah okay I've never had that knot <laughs> I never had that knot work you know but I I just like to test it and then I usually replace the standard uh, type of bulb because they get warm and even hot if you're sewing for a while and I put in a white emitted uh, LED bulb puts out a lot more light with about half of the watts and they barely get warm and they 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 just go in the same way you line up those uh, pins they're usually at the top and bottom of the of the socket push in against the spring and then turn it forward a little to lock it in eee, there you go okay so I just wanted to show you that so um, if you want to leave me now you've seen me you know t take off enough parts to expose the inside of the machine where we want to sew and you've seen me pre-treat it and pre-clean it and, and then take it to the shower and wash it dry it oil it grease it uh, do a little cleaning wax to get off greasy uh, fingerprints you know and put some car wax shine it all up and so forth so I, I Hope that uh, video was interesting to you and uh, you know you'll think about if you have a nasty old machine maybe you want to clean it uh, usually performs better and smells better <laughs> with with all the old gunk gone and new oil and grease on your machine if you care to hang out once I get this uh, all polished up and back together I'm going I need to uh, put in a new spool pin that's missing here and I need to replace the uh, friction ring or rubber tire and uh, then I, I have a potential buyer already for this machine so I thought I would just do a little sewing test at the end to show you all how it how it sews and stuff and give her an idea of the condition because uh, she she hasn't seen the machine or anything like that other than on my channel so if you'd like to hang out and catch some of that um, I'll be doing that next at the end of the video and the ending uh, slide I'm gonna put a link to my video about speeding up your motor with a brush cedar stone and that's something I always do when when I service a machine like that because it just gets the old carbon deposits off the commutator of the motor and uh, increases speed and function of the motor you'll be happy with the performance you get so if you're interested in that you can kinda go during the last 20 seconds of the video I can put a ending slide and I can put links to other YouTube videos there and I will do that thanks again for watching my channel and uh, feel free to comment and uh, hope to see you again In the meantime take care have a wonderful 2021
I guess we'd call that a refurberate, refurbished, <laughs> refurbished, yeah. Came out really nice. I, I haven't named the machine because, as I said, I have a potential buyer and she may want to. So, uh, I just wanted to do a couple finishing touches here and then do a sew test. Uh, one of the things that I want to do is replace this missing spool pin. And uh, if you've never done that uh, before, on um, these type of machines, they're called tap-in. And they're just uh, plastic. You can buy them a few places online. This one has a tapered base. And uh, over the years, I can buy these and they'll even have the same part number, but they'll be a little bit different sizes. Um, so this one is a tiny bit bigger diameter than normal. So I just take some fine sandpaper and pinch it on there and twist to just slim that down a little bit. And then, uh, let's see if we can get down here. I'm going to get it kind of started in here and uh, usually if I break these it's because I'm not hitting them straight down so I've been trying a thing where I put an old wooden uh, thread spool on there to help hold it a little and get it centered with the hopes that I uh, <laughs> don't break it. <laughs> and uh, I use a rubber mallet from the dollar store, you know, but uh, you can use a regular hammer or uh, a wooden mallet or a plastic mallet. And uh, you actually have to uh, um, hit them in there pretty firmly. Now you can take off the hand wheel if you want more clearance for your uh, hammer but I'm gonna try it just like this and see if I can't uh, get down in here the other thing is to get it in straight <laughs> uh, so it's not uh, looking like a it's been drinking or anything it's nice and straight Uh, pretty sturdy and I think just a little bit more okay um, I'll show you up here there this had one of the original spool pin felts which is this um, darker brown color and uh, I like to reuse the original ones if they have them because they're just of a denser quality than the uh, ones I can buy online and uh, so I was happy to see that put that up there I did happen to have one from a different machine uh, it's a little bit faded from uh, sunlight but at least it's the thicker quality and it's still brown so I'll put it on there mm -hmm. that, that'll work good so now you can set your spool here and run your thread behind the tensioner and up to the bobbin on the spindle and then up against the tire to turn it and speaking of the tire, this takes a uh, pretty standard one, sold the standard. It's a little bit uh, fatter and a little bit bigger um, circumference on the outside. If you have a Rocketeer like a 500A or a 503A, be sure you get the smaller diameter one. There's a smaller tire that that is used on those two models 
or if you have a non-singer um, machine you know you can just search online by your make and model number but but these just stretch right on the pulley you know they kind of peel off and stretch on and if you're in a cold climate uh, and uh, they're pretty stiff you can just soak them in hot water for a while that will make them a little more uh, pliable but if you just let's see I can get this I'm just gonna put it on all oh, this this looks like it has a part number I got my glasses on but let's see if I can give you one seven no one five two eight seven four one five two eight seven four is the part number for these that I bought just stretch it right on there and then I'll just put it up and test it make sure my tire and spindle turn good <clears throat> which they do so I'm all set came out very nice I'm real happy with it if you still want to hang on I'm just going to uh, do a little sewing on it just sim very simple to test it make sure that my tension and timing and everything is still good which it definitely should be and demonstrate to the buyer the the strength of the 404 which Singer called heavy duty <laughs> okay so again if you're leaving thanks for watching and hope to catch you next time and if not I'll be back sewing in a moment okay I'm uh, set up here with a uh, number six length the longest stitch I'm at about three and a half on the tension and I'm just sewing a couple layers of uh, Levi denim jean from the from the leg okay See if I can find the foot pedal here with my foot And I'll reverse a little. Okay. And let's take a look at this uh, stitch here. Mm -hmm. Makes a pretty top stitch, doesn't it? Mm hmm. So let's uh, let me run one down here with a shorter stitch. We can see how that looks. Come over here. So I guess instead of a six, I'll go up to about a twelve. Looks like. This will go below 20 it has a fine area just like the 401 and 403 on the feed uh, regulator so I'll uh, put this up and dial in just to the bottom of the fine area line which is about 20 stitches per inch now in you know um, this machine will will sew very delicate uh, fabrics. I mean, very del delicate with the right thread and needle, and that's why it has such a fine stitch. Most people buy a machine like this because they want to sew heavier items, so that's why I'm, uh, you know, uh, chose to demonstrate. see what that uh, looks like uh, these fine stitches are very nice if you uh, 
sewing, um, you know, like a blouse or a shirt along the collar line or sleeve line. Now it'll go, it'll go a shorter stitch than this. I kind of call this the polka dot stitch because <laughs> it's so short. But that'll give you an idea of, I do have a, a jeans needle. I have a needle in here specifically for jeans or denim or heavy, you know, canvas, duck cloth, that kind of stuff. Now here is the uh, factory uh, edging seam there and I'll fold it over on the back side and we'll see if we can sew through that because if you want to hem a pair of jeans you got to be able to make the make the hem right <laughs> so one thing I wanted to mention too that took me a while to learn this but whenever I used to sew a lot of thick stuff or layers I uh, often would break the needle and I always thought well I'm trying to sew through very thick stuff but I had a guy who uh, reupholsters car tells me no you're not using enough pressure on the pressure bar so what, what happens is the layers of fabric are so thick you know it's it's pushing up the presser bar a little bit and when you're sewing the needle doesn't clear that top layer of fabric before the feed dog starts uh you know the feed dog starts pulling the fabric so the needle point catches in that top layer of fabric and drags and snaps so he said just try adding more pressure on the presser bar and he said machines like this are good for that because you can you can play with it and get the exact pressure you want so i'll just put a little more pressure on there and uh, let's see, always want to start with this in the take up lever in the top ready to start down. Then you don't really need to hold your tails, but a lot of people are used to holding their tails. So go ahead. But let's let's see if we can just sew if I need to start it by hand or what. Whoops, that's still the 20. So I did that. Let me go down to about an eight. Okay, so I guess you see that that's not a problem for this machine. If you can see in there the 20 embedded, <laughs> and then when I went to the eight, Let's see what the back side looks like. Yep. Okay, so that's, I mean, it's sewing very well, and uh, the tension is balanced, the bobbin case tension and the upper tension. I don't know, let's, let's, I guess, I see other people do this. I guess folks are impressed by it. So here's four layers of Levi denim material with uh, number six length. A long stitch. Okay. So there we go. And the back side. Mm -hmm. When you get into a thicker layers and stuff, you start noticing that the the top and bottom stitch will start looking the same. The top stitch is always pretty. The bottom stitch can look like it runs together uh, a little bit, like here. See this one? But as you get into more and more layers, you'll start noticing that that uh, top and, whoops, where was I? Here. The top and bottom layers will start looking the same. Kind of like a 301 stitch. Now, I was going to, I dug out a, a leather needle and I was going to demonstrate with that um, on some scrap belt here, but I think I'll just go ahead and use the heavy duty needle 
because they're all set up and as usual my videos running long <laughs> so let's just try it with the heavy-duty needle whoops oh I got a little bit too much pressure on there that's why now I'm about to jump up to the double layer here let's see what happens Now that would have gone a little bit easier. I think it would have started without me turning the hand wheel if I had a real leather needle. Because the leather needle instead of a point has like a little knife blade on there. Probably could have lowered the tension too. That's a pretty tight stitch, isn't it? That orange stitch. Mm -hmm. Here you see where it got into the double layer. Let me do this one more time with less needle thread tension on there to see if my theory is true. Oh, plus I still had that on a number 12. No wonder. Did that thing jump on me or did I move it? Let's put this on a number 6 length. And because it's thicker, I'm going to go down to about a number 2 tension. Okay, let's see, let's see how that turned out. Yeah, it looks a little bit, a little bit longer of a stitch, huh? Right here. See the back side? Mm -hmm. Then when I got into the double layers, yeah, so I think you get the idea. The machine's working well, and it is a strong uh, machine. Whew. Okay, so now you can leave if you want to, but <laughs> if if you haven't had enough of Andy Tube, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and seat the brushes on this motor. To get a little more power out of it. So I'm going to demonstrate how to do that. And it's easy to do on these type of PA motors. You don't even have to take the motor out of a machine really. Mm -hmm. So let me find my brush seater stone and I'll set up and we'll do that. Okay, so I, I took off the, the motor holding bracket from the machine, and I did that. I took out the screw for this brush cap right here, so that I could pull off the brush cap and expose the commutator of the motor. Mm -hmm. See if I can get it into... Some view to move everything around a little bit. So I don't know, can you see that? Looks kind of dark on my screen, but right there that that circular copper thing with the black <laughs> carbon deposits on it. Okay. So, of course, you're working with a live motor here, so, you know, don't touch any bare wires and stuff. I have the machine in bob and winding mode. And I have a brush seating stone, or a diamond stone. And the idea is that uh, you gently rub the commutator back and forth, lightly, and this stone will crumble and polish it and polish the bottom of the brush so it makes superior contact then 
and uh, you know you 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 improve performance on the motor. So let's get going here. bit more I think did you hear that did you hear it oh did I cover that up dang let me do it again did, did you hear the motor speed up there we go that's all it takes you know so I'm going to uh, disconnect the cord from the wall here then and I'm going to hang my lamp up so I don't have to hold it that's all it is is just uh, gently moving you don't want to put the stone and leave it in one place because it can make a groove in the commutator so you just gently move it front to back on that commutator which isn't very uh, uh, let's see if I can get it up here it's not very, uh, you know, it's not very wide, like less than a half inch. So you just gently uh, back and forth. And then you can uh, blow that. There's a little bit of dust that creates, and you can blow that out, or you can uh, swab it out with some alcohol, clean alcohol. Just be sure to take the power off the machine. You know, I just use this electronics cleaner that I originally got for my computers. And I'll just spray the area a little bit. And uh, it dries very quickly. Not a problem. Now let me plug it back in here. And then I'll test it. Okay. The, the motor sounds a little funny when you lay it on the back like this. I think it stresses the bearings a little bit more. Wait, let me unplug it. Okay. Then, anyway, once you've seated the brushes like that, then you just, you know, put it back together. I do kind of an annual tune-up on my wife's machines, you know, wiping out old grease and oil and and uh, especially the grease and and putting fresh grease on and one of the things I do now that I learned about this method is I reseat the brushes on her motor and she always uh, comments on that like wow I, I can sew faster than before you did that <laughs> and I say, yeah that's cool right that's the idea Keep it, uh, keep it nice and clean, and see if I can see back in here. Uh, keep it nice and clean and running well, running very well. Okay. Now, I really am coming to the end of the video here. <laughs> <laughs> I won't uh, tease you anymore about that. And I am sorry it took a while uh, after I announced this video. It's taken me a while to get it up. Um, you know, uh, out to you on, onto my channel. But, um, some days are better than others for me. And on those days I would do some filming and a little editing. So a little extra editing because a lot of little segments on this type of uh, type of a video, but totally worth it. I did enjoy uh, working on it and making another video. So I'm hoping to be able to do another one before too much time uh, passes, and we'll 
we'll see and uh, there we go a Singer 404 degrees cleaned and polished thanks very much for tuning in and take care of yourself okay